The year is 1976. An Iranian F-4 Phantom fighter jet engages an unidentified flying object. The UFO is projecting multicolored strobe lights when suddenly it releases an object that shoots toward the Iranian pilots. The pilot gets a lock on the object, but before it can be destroyed, the plane's weapons and communication systems go down. The pilot takes immediate evasive actions. Fast forward to the 2000s, Iranian F-14 Tomcats engage another UFO. This time there are casualties. The UFO evades the fighter jets and flies out of the atmosphere at Mach 10. It would seem that Iran and UFOs have an interesting history together. When you hear stories of unidentified flying objects, you may imagine a flying saucer or little green aliens. Not only that, but the person who's giving the account seems to always be someone who's not quite all there. They tend to have their crazy hair and wild eyes, but the UFO accounts from Iran are detailed and provided by respected military personnel. The information comes from the eyewitness witness accounts and classified documents that have been leaked to the public. The first contact between a UFO and the Iranian military occurred in 1976 above the city of Tehran. It was a cool desert night. There were no clouds in the sky. The Milky Way stretched across the heavens like an oasis in a black desert. The sound of shopkeepers closing up their stalls for the night filled the air. Then suddenly, the skies over Tehran lit up. It was just after midnight on September 19th. Tehran residents began telephoning the local airport frantically relaying the same message. They were seeing bright lights in the sky. The lights seemed to hover in place and then move rapidly to a different location. It was as if the lights were looking for something or someone. The military and airport personnel checked the radar, but nothing showed up. General Yousefi, the man in charge of the airfield, stepped outside and looked up at the sky. Sure enough, he saw the bright lights for himself. He witnessed the lights jetting across the sky. They looked like shooting stars being controlled by some unseen entity. He scrambled back into the airport and found his best pilots to investigate further. General Yousefi ordered Lieutenant Yadi Nazari and a backseat weapons officer to take off and have a look at the object in the sky. It was time to get up close and personal. The F-4 Phantom fighter plane took off at 1.30 a.m and leveled off at the altitude of the unidentified object. Upon approach, the F-4 lost all navigational instruments and communications. The dials and screens in the aircraft went haywire. Nazari was flying only using his instincts and what he could see. He kept his eyes on the UFO and his aircraft pointed at the horizon. Nazari made the decision it was too dangerous to continue this way and was forced to turn around and return to base. As soon as the plane began moving away from the UFO, the instruments came back online. It was as if the UFO had some sort of electronics jammer. A second F-4 Phantom was launched at 1.40 a.m., piloted by Lt. Parvez Jafari. He approached the UFO and acquired a radar lock. This meant that there was definitely something tangible in the sky. The UFO was a solid mass that reflected the radar and therefore couldn't have been ball lightning or any form of pure energy. Upon getting closer to the UFO, Jafari reported that its lights were alternating in color from blue, green, red, and orange. They were strobing so quickly that they almost appeared to be solid. The UFO began to move south and Jafari pursued the vessel. All of a sudden, the UFO stopped in mid-air. It just sat there, unmoving, as if the law of gravity was a force that it could choose to obey or not. Jafari veered around and stopped the aircraft so he wouldn't collide with it. He turned his jet back around and headed back toward the unidentified vessel at a slower speed. On the return approach by Jafari, something even stranger happened. The UFO dropped a bright object out from its main hull. Jafari reported that the object was headed straight for him and his F-4 Phantom, and it looked like a torpedo made of light. He attempted to lock onto the incoming projectile with his AIM-9 Sidewander infrared guided missiles, but just after getting a lock, he lost all communications with his weapons console. Jafari was forced to take evasive actions and turn away from the projectile. He jammed the flight stick to the side. The F-4 did a barrel roll and avoided the incoming object. Jafari leveled off again and when he turned back to look for the object shot at him, Jafari said he saw the device reverse course and rejoin the main UFO. It then seemed to dock with the mothership. Jafari then witnessed another bright object coming out of the main UFO and descending straight down toward the ground. It left a bright trail of light as it descended. The ambient light lit up an area of around 3 kilometers. Then, as if it were done with its business it came to Iran to conduct. The UFO accelerated and shot out of the atmosphere. Jafari watched as the strobing lights faded into the night sky. As the F-4 Phantom prepared to land, 
it experienced more communication and navigational failures. Upon further investigation, a commercial airliner in the area also reported communication failures at the same time as Jafari, but the airliner did not see the UFO. Ground troops were sent to recover the fallen object, but as they approached the area, their equipment started to malfunction. No trace of whatever the UFO shot toward the ground was ever found, as far as we know. Approximately three decades went by without any reports from Iran about UFOs in their airspace. Then, in 2004, strange aircraft were once again encountered by the Iranian Air Force. At this time, Iran was still using a few F-14 Tomcats that they'd purchased from America before the revolution. The Iranian military used the Tomcats to protect their nuclear facilities. Considered one of the most successful fighter jets ever built, its speed, maneuverability, and weapon capabilities make it an aircraft to be feared and respected. The encounter in 2004 went something like this. An alarm was raised when the unidentified flying object was picked up on radar. The UFO entered the airspace above one of Iran's nuclear facilities. Fighter pilots ran to their jets. Mechanics shouted at one another as they prepared planes for takeoff. The pilots were secured in the cockpits by the support crew and the hatch was sealed. The only contact with the outside world was through their helmet. Pure oxygen was being pumped into the face mask to keep them alert. Over their comms, head military personnel were barking orders. An attack on our nuclear facilities could be incoming. We need planes in the air now, the commander shouted. The Iranian pilots flickered the afterburner switch on the engine controls. The F-14 Tomcats accelerated off the runway and into the black sky as flames shot out of the back of their jet engines. As they reached Mach 2, the sonic booms could be heard throughout the desert below. The Iranian military launched eight F-14s, eight F-4 Phantoms, and two large reconnaissance aircraft to intercept the UFO. The task force encountered objects that they'd claimed had astonishing flight characteristics. One of the F-14 Tomcats tried to lock onto the brightly shining objects, only to have his radar disrupted. The pilot who was tracking the object described it as being spherical and having a green afterburn. It was recorded that whatever engines were producing the green aura were leaving considerable amounts of turbulence behind them. It was like flying through a lightning storm. The plane shook and convulsed uncontrollably. The task force swung out of the turbulent wake of the UFO and tried to flank it from the sides. Before they could get into position, the spherical object shot off like a comet, leaving a tail of green light behind as it exited the atmosphere. The eerie glow was ingrained into the minds of the pilots who were in the task force that day. The Iranian Air Force remained on high alert for any further UFO activity after the 2004 event. Then, in 2012, another strange phenomena occurred. A UFO was spotted in Iranian airspace. It did not show up on radar at first, but then all of a sudden a blip appeared. It was like the ship was cloaked and had just appeared out of thin air. The military scrambled to the F-14s and pursued the vessel, but then tragedy struck. As one of the F-14s took off, it exploded in mid-air. The aircraft was consumed in a fireball. The smoldering metal fell from the sky and landed in the sands below. Some accounts claim that the UFO attacked the F-14 right after it took off perhaps using laser beams or a highly advanced weapon that ignited the fuel in the plane's tanks. Both of the crewmen in the plane were killed instantly. Reports by the Iranian government seem to suggest that the UFO had something to do with the mishap, but it's unclear the role the unidentified aircraft played in the catastrophe. Other F-14s flew after the unidentified object. Every time they tried to get a lock on the UFO, their armament systems would malfunction. The dull green light of their screens would appear to be working perfectly one moment, and as soon as a lock was achieved, everything went black. The pilots would try rebooting the systems mid-flight, but nothing seemed to work. The UFO quickly outpaced the F-14 Tomcats as it reached Mach 10, a speed faster than any aircraft currently produced can fly. It was almost like the UFO was toying with the F-14s. With the afterburners, the Tomcats pursued their enemy at a top speed of just over Mach 2. This is 1,534 miles per hour. The encounter ended similarly to the one in 2004. The UFO shot out of the atmosphere with a glowing tail of exhaust behind it. Each of the unexplained encounters recorded incredible capabilities of the UFOs. In all three cases, radar was jammed and weapon systems malfunctioned when the UFO was present. It seems that once the UFO left the general area, the instruments started to work properly again. You have to wonder what whoever was controlling the UFO was after. Their radar jamming capabilities seem highly sophisticated, yet 
they still allowed the Iranian military to know that they were there. Was it an accident all three times, or was the UFO testing Iran's Air Force capabilities? Another common factor between the encounters was that the UFOs all left the atmosphere after encountering the Iranian aircraft. They seemed to launch away at Mach 10, which is 10 times the speed of sound, or 7,612 miles per hour. The closest any known human aircraft has gotten to that speed was Mach 9.68. This was achieved by a NASA experimental hypersonic aircraft called the X-43. And why did they shoot out the atmosphere instead of just leaving Iranian airspace? Was there some other vessel waiting for them in orbit around the Earth? Was there a large mothership waiting to launch to light speed once the reconnaissance ships returned? All of the accounts also mention the UFO hovering, which means that they could remain in the air with a velocity of zero. The massive acceleration it would take to go from zero to Mach 10 in seconds is not possible with our current technology. All of the UFOs were also described as luminous objects. They emitted some kind of light, whether it was the strobes from 76 or the green afterburn glow of the 2000s. Could the lights be some sort of undiscovered propulsion from an advanced alien race? Or is there a country on Earth that's discovered an advanced propulsion system that the public is unaware of? There are several theories as to what the UFOs might have been. Iran has claimed that they were secret United States spy planes. They've also suggested that the aircraft were state-of-the-art drones that the US military was using to spy on Iran. However, the United States does not have the technology or capability for achieving Mach 10. It also seems unlikely that a spy aircraft would emit bright lights that would give its position away. Could the UFOs that Iran encountered be extraterrestrial? Is there any evidence to support that aliens have a special interest in Iranian nuclear sites? At this point in time, all we know is that on three separate occasions, skilled Iranian Air Force pilots encountered unidentified flying objects with advanced technological capabilities. There seems to be no definitive explanation for the UFOs encountered by Iranian military personnel. Whether the United States has advanced secret technology or Iran has encountered extraterrestrial UFOs, the three events still remain a mystery to this day. The first attack was an EMP blast that covered nearly the whole of North America, plunging the world's sole superpower into the darkness of the late Industrial Revolution. Power systems across the US were immediately knocked out, and nearly every community in the nation was plunged into darkness. A few special places, mostly military facilities, managed to either avoid the worst of the EMP blast through a quirk of the terrain or were hardened against it. Civilian planes dropped out of the sky, their onboard electronics completely fried. Military jets, however, continued to be operational, as were the US's large fleet of ground combat vehicles, all of which had been designed for a war on a nuclear battlefield against the Soviet Union or Russia. High up in the atmosphere, the EMP blast simply wasn't close enough to destroy the electronics on their shielded hardware. The US had had a few weeks to prepare, though, and almost immediately engineering crews moved into position to fix what power systems they could. Restoring the entire national grid would take years, so their efforts were focused on critical civilian and military infrastructure. Even then, it would be weeks at minimum before power could be restored to even a tiny fraction of the US. The alien spacecraft had been observed a little over a month and a half ago, first drawing the curiosity of astronomers using computers to search the night sky. The computers noticed the tiny dip in starlight as the giant craft crossed space and blocked out stars behind it. And soon, deep space reconnaissance radar was turned on to the phenomenon confirming that a solid object was indeed on an intercept course with Earth. Any doubts on the object's true nature were squashed a few days later when the object began decelerating from its current speed at 5% the speed of light. Now, with the object parked in high orbit over the Earth, the President of the United States along with the Joint Chiefs and his top advisors discussed their strategy for repelling a hostile invasion of the Earth by an alien species. The first to speak is the Chief Science Advisor confirming that the EMP pulse was an expected first strike option against the United States, which as the world's sole superpower was the likeliest target to be struck first. The advisor then pulls up images of the object made by combining direct visual observation from ground telescopes and radar telemetry, revealing a long cylinder shape with a giant, almost mushroom-style dome at the front. The advisor points at the dome. This is good news, he says, because this is exactly how we would cross space at very high speeds. The Joint Chiefs are confused. How exactly is this strange feature of the spacecraft good news? The advisor clears his throat and explains. 
Reaching velocities of a few percentage points of the speed of light is something well within our grasp today. But the biggest problem is shielding a spacecraft from debris encountered in space. At such incredibly high speeds, a pebble can strike a spacecraft with the force of hundreds of tons of TNT. And while debris is extremely rare in the vacuum of space, it is not non-existent. Therefore, a large shield at the front of a large thin spacecraft is the best way to shield your vehicle. And because this is how we would do it, the advisor explains, then this means that our alien invaders technology cannot be too far ahead of our own. We have a fighting chance. The men and women who will decide the fate of the United States and possibly the Earth all look around the room at each other. A chance, any chance, is more than they'd hoped for. The advisor once more clears his throat. Because their technology isn't too far advanced from ours and they obviously want our planet intact, since they're reluctant to simply drop asteroids on our head from orbit, then I have a plan to win this war. Let me explain. A day after the EMP blast, ground-based radar confirms activity along the main body of the spacecraft. Several components are detaching from it and breaking up into smaller objects, transport craft of some sort. Some, though, are obviously combat craft, as these move to new orbits. The US military, however, has already guessed what the aliens might do next, and they're ready. From several hundred miles up, metal rods half the size of telephone poles rain down on military installations across the US. The rods pack no explosives, instead relying on the kinetic energy of their fall from space to deliver devastation on the scale of mankind's largest non-nuclear weapons. Military airfields, hangars, command and control nodes, supply depots, metal rods rain down on these and other strategic targets, completely obliterating them. But the US was ready, and following protocols established long ago for a nuclear war had already widely dispersed its personnel and equipment. Many military aircraft and ground combat vehicles are destroyed in the attack, but many more survive, widely dispersed into the surrounding areas and on the thousands of civilian and makeshift airfields all across the US. As the attack takes place, the President and his advisors secure in an underground bunker over a mile deep monitor the situation through dozens of redundant command and control networks. The US's plans for a nuclear showdown with the Soviet Union have created one of the most resilient nations on Earth. The science advisor predicted this attack and works to reassure his fellow colleagues. Because the aliens aren't too far advanced from us, he explains, they have many of the same limitations in space travel that we do, even if they are much better at dealing with them than us. The economy of space travel makes moving large amounts of equipment, like an invasion fleet, extremely expensive, so the aliens are dealing with very limited assets. Our plan for victory is to simply bleed the aliens dry, making an invasion of our nation so expensive in terms of manpower and resources that the aliens are unable to continue the fight or it simply isn't worth it anymore. The plan is solid, after all, the aliens have had to bring everything to invade our world with them, including their troops, while we here on Earth can regenerate every soldier killed on the spot. The war will be of one long, ongoing resistance. The aliens may be limited in resources due to having to ferry them across interstellar space, but they are still much superior to our own forces. The US military thus makes the best use of its assets in the short time that it will still be able to before they are inevitably destroyed. Within hours of the kinetic strikes, the troop transports and combat aircraft begin to enter the atmosphere. Here, with their sensors blinded by the incredible heat of re-entry, is humanity's best chance at striking with all available air and missile forces. All across the world, combat aircraft and air defense batteries move into action. Over the skies of the US, squadrons of F-22s, F-35s, F-16s, and every other plane capable of taking on an interceptor role move in to intercept the incoming alien spacecraft. Heat-guided ground-based interceptors fire in large volleys, guided to their targets by the unmistakable heat signature of the alien spacecraft entering the Earth's atmosphere. The combat aircraft is next, firing radar and heat-guided missiles in rapid succession at swarms of alien craft screaming through the atmosphere. The President had considered using nuclear weapons, but was talked down by his advisors. The aliens had yet to use weapons of mass destruction, and using a nuke may well be an invitation to a type of war the Earth couldn't hope to win. Conventional weapons are having a spectacular effect on the incoming alien craft, though, and cheers erupt in the President's secure facility as the reports trickle in from all over the US. Moving at such high speeds, the superior alien craft simply can't avoid the incoming volleys, or they'd risk tearing themselves apart. And despite whatever type of propulsion or radar absorbent materials they may be using, the signature of incoming spacecraft at high speeds moving through the atmosphere is almost too easy a target for Earth's weapons. The victory, however, is extremely short-lived. 
America's combat pilots were warned to immediately break off their attacks once the spacecraft punched through the atmosphere, but for many it's still too late. Now within the atmosphere, the alien combat aircraft easily outmaneuver and outrun even America's best fighter craft. The casualties are in the hundreds within minutes. Next, the combat aircraft strike at air defense batteries all over the US, easily destroying any they encounter and calling in orbital strikes on those they can't reach. More metal rods from space obliterate air defense batteries across America, though their crews are long gone. The aliens now rule not just space but the skies too. With alien transports discouraging combat troops by the thousands, America's ground response is mostly infantry-based. With space firmly in the aliens' grasp, more kinetic strikes would easily obliterate large formations of armored vehicles. For the first time in modern history, the United States doesn't rule the skies, and has to fight much in the same way its adversaries have. In some places, though, commanders are able to maneuver combat vehicles to within very close range of the enemy. Hugging the enemy, so to speak, forces the aliens to not use kinetic strikes for fear of hitting their own troops. Forced to ferry all of their invasion equipment from space, the alien forces are fielding very few combat vehicles of their own, despite their infantry weapons being superior to man's. Without combat vehicles, American Abrams tanks and M2 Bradleys decimate alien forces when they encounter them. No matter their level of technology, even aliens must obey the laws of physics, and despite their advanced construction, the anti-tank silver bullet rounds of an Abrams or lethal missiles of a Bradley are extremely effective against the alien vehicles. Once more though, victories are short-lived, as alien air forces who now have uncontested dominance of the sky do the job of close air support that orbital kinetic strikes simply can't do. The aliens' numbers build by the day, and by the end of the week they've disgorged several million troops on US soil. Then the shuttle flights slow down considerably, with the ability to only bring a limited number of troops and equipment across the vast distances of space. The aliens have clearly disgorged nearly all of their combat assets. Their advanced technology will make up the shortfall in personnel, or at least that was the plan. The aliens hail from a planet a hundred light years from Earth, making their observations of our planet a hundred years old and their invasion plans are based on fighting a civilization whose planet exhibited the techno-signature of a late industrial age civilization. Then, moving at 5% the speed of light, it took the invasion fleet another 20 years to arrive. That means the best knowledge the aliens had on Earth's level of technology was based on distant observations of the Earth in the year 1900, when the most advanced techno-signature detectable was weak radio transmissions. Now they face humanity armed with automatic machine guns, manned portable anti-tank missiles, electronic warfare suites, and extremely stealthy combat drones. The war of occupation is indeed costly, but the technological disparity still favors the aliens. To offset their lack of manpower, the aliens turn to manufacturing combat drones of their own, who can quickly self-replicate and overwhelm human forces. Within a week, the conventional war is over, and the US military is roundly defeated, unable to fight any longer. This is when phase two of the US's victory plan over the aliens takes effect. Seasoned combat troops are ordered to disperse widely into the countryside, taking with them as much military equipment as they can carry. American Special Forces operatives are amongst those ordered to flee for the wilderness or the ruins of cities, and there they link up with other military personnel and civilian survivors. Special Forces operators initiate Phase 2 and begin training surviving combat troops and civilians in the art of resistance. American forces are taught to hide from and fight a technologically superior enemy, the same way that the Taliban and the Viet Cong resisted US might. A guerrilla war begins overnight, with American survivors striking at alien supply depots and personnel barracks. The goal is simple destroy as much equipment as possible, and kill as many aliens as possible so that the invasion becomes too costly in terms of lives and finances to continue. The guerrilla resistance lasts for years, despite horrific losses incurred by the human survivors. Yet humanity can quickly replace its losses, though it does mean that the traditional societal norms of relationships have to be temporarily redefined. Men and women cannot have a single sexual partner and must have multiple in order to ensure genetic diversity, and healthy women must produce children as often as possible. The losses incurred by human gorillas are staggering and must be replaced. The aliens, on the other hand, must travel 20 years to bring fresh troops into the fight, and each individual soldier transported over a hundred light years of space cost their civilization a small fortune. The first wave of reinforcements cost the aliens as much as the entire economic output of Earth over an entire decade. There is no second wave of reinforcements, the trip is too long, the cost far too great, 
even a rescue mission to their forces stranded on Earth would be too expensive and come far too late. What aliens are able to retreat back to their orbiting spacecraft, but most simply surrender to human forces? For Earth, the cost has been staggering, and humanity has gone from a population of almost 8 billion to just over 1 billion. But the war has been won. Earth is free of invaders for the first time in 30 years, and the survivors can once more rebuild their shattered nations. Much as it has many times before, humanity will rise from the ashes, and should the aliens send another invasion force in the future, they'll meet a planet armed with their own advanced technology, reverse engineered for human use, and determined to remain free. The date is late December 1980, and US military forces have been invited to Britain on behalf of the Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. After the Soviet Union's invasion of Afghanistan the year before, all of NATO is on edge and US troop presence in Europe has been increased as a precaution. The US Air Force and the Royal Air Force both operate two air bases known as Woodbridge and Bentwaters, home to several squadrons of fighters, bombers, and unknown to the public, a small stockpile of American nuclear weapons meant to be employed against the Soviet Union in case of war. Strange lights have been reported in the sky by both military and civilian personnel over the preceding few weeks, but nobody's paid much attention to them, being explained away as military aircraft or simple meteors. Deputy Base Commander Colonel Charles Halt, however, has been witness to these objects and is troubled by his or any of his staff's inability to explain their presence. He resolves to investigate the phenomenon if an opportunity ever presents itself. He would not have to wait long. On the night of December 26, the US Air Force Security Police noticed strange lights in the forest outside the small airbase. The lights seemed to fluctuate as they moved through the treetops, and the airmen fear that an aircraft has suffered some form of malfunction. They radio for permission to investigate the site, which is off base and technically outside of their jurisdiction as American security police. Nonetheless, fearing a serious emergency with a military or civilian aircraft, the airmen are given permission. Four security policemen thus set off into the forest to investigate, though one of them is convinced that there's been no crash, as he believes he saw the lights actually land safely on the forest floor. This security policeman, Staff Sergeant Bud Stevens, refuses to leave the base perimeter and investigate the site, terrified by what he believes he had seen. Airman First Class Cabin Seg, Staff Sergeant Jim Penniston, and Airman First Class John Burroughs thus drive into the forest alone. It's not long before they spot a bright shining light coming through the trees. They attempt to follow it with their vehicle but are unable to due to the difficult terrain and are forced to proceed on foot. As they move closer to the mysterious light though, the radios begin to malfunction, so Sergeant Penniston orders Airman Cabasang to remain by the vehicle where the radios are unaffected so he can relay back to central security control if need be. The two airmen notice that animals on a nearby farm seem to be in a highly agitated state, further setting the men on edge as they continue forward through the thick brush. Radio comms, even back to Cabasang barely 100 meters away, completely fail and Sergeant Penniston orders Airman Burroughs to head back to the tree line so he can maintain a radio link back to Cabasang. Burroughs, however, is so afraid that he refuses to leave Sergeant Penniston's company, and the two continue on together. Now just 50 meters away, the men get a look at the source of the light. It's a metallic object, glowing brightly and causing the air to be charged with electricity. The men's hairs start to stand on end as they approach even closer, making out more details of the luminous object. Despite the light, the skin of the craft seems to be black and metallic and is triangular in shape, measuring 3 meters in width and 2 in height, roughly the size of a tank. White light seems to be emitted from both the top and bottom, with flashing blue and red lights along the side of it. Sergeant Penniston uses a camera he's brought with him to snap photos of the object and notices that there seems to be no seams, rivets, or other signs of manufactured origin. It's as if the entire craft was made out of one solid piece of metal. Touching the object with his hand, he's surprised to find it warm, and as he slides his hand along the smooth metal discovers a series of raised symbols etched along the left side. As he moves his hand along the symbols though, something incredible happens. The craft emits a blinding white light, causing the men to stumble backwards. Sergeant Penniston is so afraid the craft is going to explode that he ducks for cover behind a thick oak tree. Suddenly, the craft is completely engulfed in white light and lifts up off the ground, quickly shooting through the trees and up into the night sky. The men immediately report back to base and are told they have misidentified some natural phenomenon. Penniston, however, has kept detailed notes of the entire encounter in his logbook, which he presents at the debriefing. The men are told simply to forget what they think they saw. The photos taken are confiscated and never seen again. Base Deputy Commander Colonel Charles Halt hears about the UFO when he returns to the base the following morning. 
He orders Airman Cabasang to report to his office and debriefs him personally. But with no further evidence, the case remains a curiosity and nothing more. Until just 24 hours later, Colonel Halt is at a party attended by both British and American officers when he receives a call. The UFO is back. Halt wastes no time and immediately leaves the party assembling a patrol to investigate the sighted craft once more and hopefully debunk it. Upon entering the forest, Halt and his men discover that other patrols have already arrived, but are experiencing difficulties with the electronics in their patrol vehicles and their radios. Nobody has seen the exact whereabouts of the craft, however, so Halt takes his team toward the original landing location from two nights ago. As they arrive, they spot a glowing red object moving through the forest ahead of them. Halt, who is carrying a mini tape recorder, begins making notes as he observes the craft. He was in a pigmentation. You just saw a light yes, where? Where? Right in this position here, straight ahead, in between the switch. There it is again. Watch. Straight ahead off my flash right there. Yeah, so there it is. Oh, yeah, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. So, yeah, can I get some of Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Looks like uh, maybe a quarter to a half mile, maybe further out. I'm going to switch off. The light is gone now. It was approximately 120 degrees from the site. Is it back again? Yes, sir. As the men investigate the light in the distance, they notice that the farm animals nearby, which had been going crazy, seem to have quieted down, as if something was terrifying them into silence. Undaunted, the men push on and run straight into a flashing red light directly ahead of them. We have the first night bird we've seen. We're about 150 or 200 yards from the site. Everything else is just deathly calm. There is no doubt about it. There's some type of strange flashing red light ahead. There's yellow. I saw a yellow tinge in it, too. Weird. It, it appears to be maybe moving a little bit this way. Yes, it's brighter than it has been. Yellow. It's coming this way. Also, it is definitely coming this way. Pieces of it are shooting off. Yeah, there is no doubt about it. This is weird. To the left. Yeah, definitely moving off. Two, two lights. Two one right. light to the front okay. one light to the left. Keep the flashlights off. The men spot the light moving slowly toward them and incredibly splitting off what appears to be chunks of molten metal as the light moves. Undaunted, the American airmen move toward the light again. That's a push to the edge of the woods up there. Can you want to do it without lights? Let's do it carefully. Come on. Okay, we're looking at the thing. We're probably about two to three hundred yards away. It looks like an eye winking at you. It's still moving from side to side. And when you put the star scope on it, it, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark center. It's, it's, yeah, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. And the flash is so bright to the star scope that uh, it almost burns your eye. Colonel Halt and his men move toward the light, and to conserve tape, the colonel stops recording. The men push through the woods and cross a small creek, when incredibly, they spot not one, but multiple lights. We passed the farmer's house and crossed into the next field. Now we have multiple sightings of up to five lights with a similar shape and all, but they seem to be steady now rather than a pulsating or glow with a red flash. We just crossed the, the creek. And uh, we're getting what kind of readings now? Getting th three good clicks on the meter and we're seeing strange lights in the sky. As the men watch, they suddenly spot numerous lights, almost as if they've been lured into the midst of their own personal light show. Zero to 315, now we've got an object about 10 degrees directly south. 10 degrees off the horizon. And the ones in the north are moving, one's moving away from us. Moving out fast. And we're both heading north. Okay, here, here he comes from the south. He's coming toward us now. Now we're observing what appears to be a beam coming down to the ground. This is unreal. Incredibly, one of the craft seems to emit a beam of light that lights the ground a few dozen meters in front of the men. On the recording, the other men with Colonel Halt can be heard excitedly cursing and muttering in fear when the colonel stops the tape again. By now, he's had enough and believes he and his men may be in danger, so he orders them to return to the base. Incredibly, the lights continue to put on their light show, with one even flying over the air base and being spotted by the colonel and his men beaming a light down to an unspecified location on the base. Shortly after the incident, the British Ministry of Defense and the United States Office of Special Investigations conducted an investigation into the incident, declaring that there existed nothing of any notable concern that had occurred that night. Many, including Colonel Halt himself, believe the governments of the United States and Great Britain covered up the incident and suppressed much of the evidence, though the colonel's own recording was kept safe and released to the public in the 2000s. 
Much of the physical evidence, such as indentations at the landing site and radiation counts recorded by Colonel Halt and his team, would be explained away as being nothing more than rabbit burrows or normal background radiation spikes. However, if we're to believe Colonel Halt's version of the events, then this might be nothing more than disinformation meant to silence any discussion about the incident, or to at least ruin the credibility of the witnesses. In the end, the best evidence we have is the Colonel's tape itself. And it's clear on the tape that whatever happened that night, a half dozen American airmen and a deputy commander of an American airbase all believed that they were truly witnessing physical phenomenon taking place before their very eyes. Whether it was alien or not, or perhaps simply a mass delusion, we may never know. We have confirmed that a number of these unidentified objects are indeed solid. So said the leader of the Pentagon's newest investigation into UFOs, which you probably know as UAPs today. The long culture of ridicule is officially over, UFOs are real, they are here, and nobody has a clue who's building them. But while UFOs were part of American culture for nearly a century now, the world would be shocked at the disturbing similarities between events happening in the US and a world away behind the impenetrable Iron Curtain. The secrecy is over, and what has come from declassified sources both within the former Soviet government and the CIA itself is nothing short of terrifying. Soviet sightings of UFOs run as long as sightings in America, but most Soviet citizens had no clue what was going on in their own backyards. Thanks to a strict culture of secrecy and censorship, it wasn't until Glasnost started to open Soviet society up that the lid on the Soviet UFO secret finally came unscrewed. Some news outlets purposefully dramatized relatively ordinary events as they exercised newly found freedoms and pushed just to see how far they could take things. However, there were plenty of very real UFO-related events happening, and some were high-profile enough to catch the attention of CIA spies behind the Iron Curtain. On January 29, 1986, at 7.55 p.m., a quote, amazing event occurred on Hill 611 near the village of Dalnegorsk in Primorsky Kray. This small mining town is of no note, but that night it would become the most important place in the entire Soviet Union. That evening, multiple villagers observed a reddish sphere flying into the town from the southeast. The object flew while making no noise and appeared to be a nearly perfect sphere of rust red. It got close enough for people to observe that the outer skin of this strange craft was without blemish and had no obvious control surfaces nor means of propulsion. For a while, the object hovered up and down over the village, moving at a relatively slow pace. As it ascended, it would glow brighter before dimming as it descended. Suddenly, the object appeared to be in distress. All witnesses interviewed later by Soviet authorities recalled just how the object jerked or jumped suddenly, then fell like a rock straight down onto Hill 611. Witnesses heard a dull thump as it impacted and then began to burn intensely for an hour. Valery Voshilny, head of the Far Eastern Committee for Anomalous Phenomena, arrived at the site two days after the crash. He noticed that despite everything being covered in deep snow, the site of the crash was completely devoid of it allowing him to observe splintered silica rocks, which could only have occurred from extreme temperatures. The rocks were also smoky looking as if they'd been exposed to intense heat. However, Vulzhilny also found physical evidence of the craft. All over the site, embedded in the rocks themselves, he discovered silvery pieces of metal. Some were fragments, but a large amount had formed into droplets, almost as if they'd been sprayed over the area. This detail would become significant after the fall of the Iron Curtain, when Western UFOologists would compare notes with their Eastern counterparts. American witnesses had very often reported seeing flying orbs, which seemed to spray metal while showing signs of some kind of distress. At the edge of the crash site was a tree stump that had been severely burned and emitted a strange chemical smell. The physical remains were examined at the Omsk branch of the Academy of Sciences, who made a shocking discovery. Some of the fragments had formed into what appeared to be small nets, and when these were put under examination, it was discovered that they were made up of torn and very thin threads, 17 micrometers in width. Each thread consisted of even thinner fibers tied up in plates, and intertwined with the fibers were thin, solid gold wires. The technology to replicate this type of delicate nano construction wouldn't appear on the Earth for decades, at least not in human hands anyway. The fragments, which had formed into iron balls, were also put under a battery of tests. Each ball consisted of iron with various levels of aluminum, manganese, nickel, chromium, tungsten, and cobalt. This seemed to rule out a natural creation and the object just being a very peculiar meteorite. Rather, it mostly confirmed that the object was built from heterogeneous alloys, 
When the balls were melted in a vacuum chamber, they reacted in various ways. On one base they would melt and spread out as expected, but on another they formed into smaller balls with convex glass-like structures. But melting the remains revealed yet another mystery. Gold, silver, and nickel would disappear from the balls and be replaced with molybdenum, despite not being present in the sanitized test chamber before testing commenced. The metallic remains would confuse Soviet scientists as they only produced more questions than answers. About the only thing they were able to identify was ashes discovered on the site belonging to a biological being. Perhaps the ashes belonged to an unfortunate animal caught under the crash, or perhaps they belonged to the operator of the mysterious UFO. Sadly, the intense heat made any attempt at identification impossible. Unable to tease out details from the remains, the investigation turned to the object itself before it crashed. The trajectory as reported by eyewitnesses happens to coincide with the flight path taken by rockets launched by China's Xishang Cosmodrome. However, investigators weren't able to verify if any launches had taken place in January from the complex, and the Chinese were not forthcoming with any answers, likely looking to keep their space program as secret as possible. However, the investigation revealed something very startling. Soviet citizens had not been the first to spot this mysterious object, the Chinese had already observed it over their own territory. Just days prior to the crash, witnesses close to the Xishang Cosmodrome reported a similar red sphere on January 25th. According to witnesses, the object appeared to simply hover, almost as if observing the Cosmodrome directly. After half an hour, it disappeared. The Chinese sighting wasn't the only clue that this object had traveled great distances, though. There was physical evidence, too. Examination of the soil at the crash site revealed small pieces of light gray-colored soil, but only in the area where the object was presumed to have made direct contact before exploding and mostly disintegrating. Put under spectroscopic analysis, the light gray soil was matched with soil from another area in Russia thousands of miles away. The soil matched tufts from the area of Yaroslava, northeast of Moscow, containing characteristic elements found there and not in the Dalnogorsk area. Whatever had crashed there, it was obvious somebody came looking for it, though. Eight days after the crash on Hill 611 at 8.30 p.m. on February 8, 1986, eyewitnesses once more reported strange objects in the sky. This time, two yellowish spheres flew into the town from the north. The spheres seemed to be looking for something and made their way directly to the crash site. Once there, they circled the crash site four times, then turned to the north and flew back the way they came. Was it a search and rescue effort by whatever had sent the original sphere there, or simply something wanting to make sure no identifiable remains had been left behind? To this day, nobody knows, but reports of flying spheres exactly mirror similar reports from all the way across the ocean in the United States. And the following year, whoever had visited the sleeping mining town returned in force. November 28, 1987, 1124 p.m. Reports of flying spheres flood a local military base. Terrified villagers report seeing as many as 32 flying objects, which spread out over 12 different nearby villages. Alarmed Soviet military personnel quickly make their way to the nearest villages and observe the strange flying lights for themselves. Before the night was over, hundreds of civilians and military personnel would bear witness to one of the largest mass UFO sightings in history. The objects appeared specifically interested in Dalnogorsk, and 13 of them broke away and flew directly to the mining village. Once there, three of them hovered stationary over the village, while five seemed to illuminate the nearby mountain and crash site. They appeared to move with no discernible propulsion and made no noise, hovering at varying altitudes between 150 and 800 meters. As the lights flew over homes, people reported disturbances of their electrical equipment. Ministry of Internal Affairs officers would later testify that they observed multiple objects at 11.30 p.m. One object flew toward them from the direction of the Gorley settlement, leaving a, quote, fiery flame behind it. At the head of the flame was an opaque sphere, and within that sphere was another smaller red sphere. At a local quarry, eyewitnesses observed a large cylindrical object the size of a five-story building flying directly toward them. The object was around 200 or 300 meters, with the front lit up like burning metal. Terrified that the object was going to crash into them, many of them fled for shelter. The quarry manager observed the object moving at an altitude of about 300 meters. Large and cigar-shaped, the description would also precisely fit that given by American and Western European witnesses of very similar objects. The object appeared to fly without the aid of wings and no discernible propulsion, making no noise as it flew over the quarry. Nearby, a kindergarten teacher observed a dark, metallic-looking, elongated object 
she estimated at 10 to 12 meters long. The object appeared to be in front of a bright, blinding sphere of light that hovered noiselessly at the height of a nine-story building. The object hovered over a school and shot a half-meter-wide violet bluish ray down at the ground in front of the school. The teacher remarked that the objects caught in the ray did not create shadows as would be expected if they were being illuminated from above. The object then departed the school and moved to a nearby mountain. According to her, the object appeared to be searching for something, emitting a reddish projector-like light onto the mountain. Finally, the object simply departed by flying over the mountain and out of sight. The crash and subsequent UFO invasion of Dalnegorsk would remain secret for years, but once it made its way into the West, the similarities between this event and multiple similar events in the US would convince researchers that Americans and Soviets were both observing the same mysterious phenomenon. Cigar-shaped objects and mysterious balls of light are a commonly reported type of UFO in the US for decades, and multiple eyewitnesses have reported what they thought were malfunctioning air or spacecraft of some kind which bobbed up and down, as reported by the Dalnegorsk witnesses, while emitting a shower of what appeared to be molten metal. Curiously, some of the craft described by the Dalnegorsk witnesses bear a strong resemblance to the infamous US Navy Tic Tac video, filmed by fighter pilots intercepting an unidentified aircraft over the Pacific Ocean. But this isn't the only parallels between Soviet and American UFO sightings, because while America had Roswell, the Soviets also had their own close encounter with alien beings, and their encounter had more and better witnesses than Roswell. It is not a joke nor a hoax nor a sign of mental instability nor an attempt to drum up local tourism by drawing the curious, so said the Soviet state press agency TASS, discussing a UFO close encounter in 1989. According to the official report, two boys and a girl from a local school were playing in a park on the evening of September 27th. At approximately 6.30, the children observed something pink shining in the sky, followed by a ball of deep red colors they estimated at 9 meters in diameter. A small crowd gathered as the ball seemed to land, and a hatch opened in the lower part of the ball. From within the ball, three aliens with three eyes each exited, standing nearly 3 meters tall. The aliens seemed to have a robot companion with them, which they activated with a touch. As the crowd watched in awe, the aliens seemed to communicate with each other, ignoring the onlookers, until a young boy screamed in terror. Suddenly, one of the aliens locked his three eyes on the child and caused him to become temporarily paralyzed. The three aliens then re-entered their vehicle, but quickly re-emerged, with one carrying what the crowd thought was a gun of some kind. The alien aimed the tube at a 16-year-old boy who suddenly vanished, only to reappear after the aliens re-entered their craft to depart. The story was met with both ridicule and a serious investigation, as is typical of UFO reports. To this day, accounts vary. A Soviet evening news correspondent dispatched to the town with a film crew failed to find any eyewitnesses to the aliens except for the children. However, they did speak with the local police chief, who confirmed one important detail of the account. He too had seen a large, silently flying craft shortly before the alleged landing took place. Soil analysis discovered high concentrations of radioactive isotopes in the landing area, but this proved inconclusive as after the Chernobyl disaster it was not uncommon to discover small pockets of highly concentrated radioactive isotopes. However, what's curious is that if it was a hoax, the children just happened to pick a landing spot with said high concentrations of isotopes, which would require analysis in a lab to even identify. Even more curious, when the children were separated into different rooms by investigators, they all drew nearly the exact same craft from memory. The craft was also said to leave behind a mysterious X-shaped sign in the sky as it took off, exactly mirroring UFO encounters reported in the United States by the defunct American magazine Saga in 1976. Given the strict censorship of the Soviet Union in the 70s, it is nigh an impossibility the children or police chief would have had access to said magazine. But why were there no other eyewitnesses to the alien beings themselves? One only need to look at the culture of ridicule surrounding UFOs to understand why a bunch of adults in the repressive communist Soviet Union would not want to speak up about such an extraordinarily weird event. As highlighted in the United States' own recent UAP investigation, a culture of ridicule has, quote, hampered our efforts to collect good data, as pilots are self-censoring for the fear of ridicule and it affecting their future careers. The US Air Force and Navy took that recommendation so seriously that they immediately instituted new guidelines for reporting UFOs, ending the infamous century-long culture of ridicule that silenced witnesses even amongst America's most elite military units. 
Soviet pilots, however, were long reporting UFOs and on occasion even being killed by them. While on a routine flight over the city of Borisov, two Soviet fighters spotted a large flying disc near the city. The disc seemed to have five beams of light emanating from it. Two were directed upwards into the sky, and three were pointed down at the ground. Ground control instructed the patrol to fly in for a closer look, an act that would doom one of the pilots. On approach, the disc suddenly flew up to match the speed and level with the lead Soviet fighter. Suddenly, it aimed one of its beams directly at the plane, filling the cockpit with blinding light. The co-pilot was at the controls, and the flight logs recorded him reporting a bright ray of light entering the cockpit and projecting a spot about 20 centimeters in diameter. This ray of light swept across the cockpit and directly through the pilot's body, with both pilot and co-pilot reporting extreme heat. The plane broke off and returned to base immediately. Shortly afterwards, the co-pilot's health immediately deteriorated with frequent fainting spells that forced him into retirement. The aircraft commander, however, died within a few months of the incident, with the cause of death listed as cancer. This wouldn't be the only report of a UFO shooting beams of light, though. A declassified CIA report notes an encounter with hundreds of eyewitnesses, including a Major V. Loganov, outside the city of Omsk. In his own official report, the Major states that he and other eyewitnesses spotted a strange object in the sky which radar could not pick up. The object passed overhead at an altitude of several kilometers, revealing a shining sphere one and a half times as large as the current full moon. The object was casting four very bright beams of light, sometimes parallel to the ground and sometimes at an angle. The UFO hovered over a civilian airport for five minutes and even descended a bit. Suddenly, the beams of light disappeared and a whirling plume trail appeared around the shining sphere. With an extraordinary burst of speed, the object took off to the east. Pilots from a nearby second airport reported seeing the object but being unable to pick it up on their radars. Immediately relaying the sighting up the chain of command, within five minutes other military personnel at Alte Cray reported having the same object under visual observation. Given the time and distance, the object appeared to have traveled 600 kilometers at a speed of about 7,000 kilometers an hour. UFO sightings were so frequent in the Soviet Union that the declassified CIA report also notes a meeting of 100 Soviet scientists from various disciplines, all meeting together to discuss the dramatic uptick in UFO sightings in the 1970s and the 1980s. It's now known that some UFO reports inside the Soviet Union were highly secretive U.S. air and spacecraft. Other sightings were misattributed to everything from secret rocket launches to failed rockets or simply spent rocket stages. However, just like multiple American UFO investigations would reveal, that still left a significant number, about 5% of sightings that simply could not be explained. And most disturbing of all were reports from Soviet nuclear facilities of unidentified craft that perfectly mirror similar reports from the United States in the same time period. In one high-profile encounter, a UFO nearly started World War III. Colonel Boris Solikov spoke with Western UFO investigators after the fall of the Soviet Union, reporting that on the night of October 4, 1982, there was a breach of airspace over a nuclear weapons site in Usovoyan, Ukraine. Solikov, who was working at the Kremlin at the time, described receiving alarmed reports from the facility whose operators had informed him their launch panels all had suddenly activated on their own, something which should have been impossible. For four hours, the entire facility watched a hovering UFO as it loitered directly overhead. While it hovered, the control panels, which could launch the nuclear weapons stored there, suddenly came to life, something which could have only happened with the input of the proper launch codes. The incident sparked a 10-year investigation by the Soviets into the UFO phenomenon, which they kept under wraps until the end of the Cold War. This event closely mirrors a similar incident at a U.S. nuclear facility in Minot Air Force Base, when security personnel observed a UFO which hovered over the silos holding America's nuclear-tipped Minutemen missiles. According to witnesses, the missiles briefly became active and went into launch state, despite having received no such authorization or command from their control centers. Perhaps unsurprisingly, UFO reports around Soviet nuclear facilities remain very difficult to verify, but the Soviet Union had a plethora of otherworldly sightings which only grew in number as the Cold War dragged on. At 4.05 a.m. on September 20, 1977, a group of dock workers in Petrozavoytsk witnessed a blinding light on the horizon from the direction of Lake Onega. The light approached the slumbering city before shifting into the shape of a glimmering jellyfish 
whom according to eyewitnesses began to hover over the city and shoot thin beams of light down into the city. The dock workers were terrified, concerned that their nation was under attack, this being the height of the Cold War. Paranoia over a nuclear conflict between the Soviet Union and the US was running high. After 12 minutes of shooting beams of light down into the city, the UFO transformed once more into a bright semicircle and shot back off in the direction it came. Suddenly, it veered upwards and punched through the clouds, leaving a burning red hole where it passed that quickly dissipated. Later that morning, more witnesses would come forward, and the list would grow from the initial dock workers to police officers, sailors, and an ambulance crew and a reporter for the state news agency. Under pressure to prevent an all-out alarm, the reporter would post a story three days later calling the phenomenon strange and natural. The object left no physical evidence behind save for a photograph allegedly taken of the object by one of the witnesses. However, given the veil of secrecy in the Soviet Union at the time, the photograph has been impossible to verify. However, neighboring local governments became so alarmed by the incident that they demanded an answer from the Kremlin leadership. When they were unable to provide a satisfactory response, the event was taken to the Academy of Sciences, where the Soviet Union's most prolific scientific minds worked. They couldn't come up with an explanation for the sighting, but after doing some research, concluded that the UFO phenomenon was very real and required more dedicated investigation. The Academy's secret investigation started a year later and ran all the way until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Unofficially known as the Network, this government-backed investigation ran for 13 years and had one goal – scientifically understand the UFO phenomenon. The network enjoyed the support of 20 different organizations staffed by specialists in physics, chemistry, optics, and spectroscopy. The initial investigation was kept top secret for two reasons – either it would verify the existence of extraterrestrial life, or the findings could have some form of defense value. The network also had to coordinate its investigation with the defense ministry a task which created some conflict. Where scientists working for the network found a mystery needing scientific investigation, the defense ministry simply saw a threat or potential enemy, thus the two sides had vastly differing approaches to their UFO investigations. Even so, the two sides worked together to gather UFO data. The network gathered reports from scientific institutes and Soviet citizens, while the defense ministry gathered them from within the Soviet military perhaps spurred on by repeated violations of their air and space by very advanced American aircraft, first the U-2 and then the Blackbird spy aircraft, Soviet soldiers were under strict orders to report all mysterious phenomenon, especially if it interfered with their equipment. This was stark in contrast to the US, where a culture of ridicule had sprung up in both the military and civilian sectors, despite multiple ongoing secret investigations by the Department of Defense. The network would go on to investigate 3,000 UFO reports, debunking all but 300 of them which they had no explanation for. The results would mirror both the US Air Force's Project Blue Book effort and the latest investigation into UAPs by the Department of Defense, but this debunking work was critical for the understanding of what was a real UFO and what wasn't, even when the Soviet Union's secrecy made such work difficult. The Petrozavoytsk event, for instance, would be solved by an American engineer working for NASA who put together the pieces missed by the Soviets. Using NASA's satellite tracking center, he discovered that the Soviets had launched an object from their top-secret cosmodrome in nearby Plisetsk at 3.58 am just minutes before the sighting. However, that doesn't explain the motion witnessed and attested to by many observers. Rockets can only go up, even if they do so at a very diagonal angle. They certainly can't hover and they can't lose or gain altitude at will. Could the UFO then been a response to the top secret launch minutes before, or was it a case of bad eyewitnesses being very mistaken about what they saw? We may never know the truth, but what we can be sure of is that something was recreating the same exact UFO phenomenon over the Soviet Union that was taking place over American skies. The year was 1956 at the White Sands Missile Testing Grounds near Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico. The site was used for rocket tests, and Major William Cunningham was involved in collecting debris for tests after a successful launch. Assisting him was Air Force Sergeant Jonathan P. Lovett. It was an uneventful day full of tedious work, and the two men separated to cover different areas of the field. But what had been a predictable day of work was about to become anything but when Cunningham was snapped out of his labor by a blood-curdling scream from nearby. 
it was love it. In the New Mexico desert, danger wasn't uncommon, especially with venomous snakes everywhere. Cunningham was prepared to spring into action with first aid if Lovett had been bitten, but he wasn't prepared for what he found. The scream was Lovett, but what had grabbed him wasn't a snake or anything from this world. Lovett was being dragged, screaming in terror by a long metal arm that was wrapped around his legs. It was so long Cunningham didn't even know where it ended until he looked up. The long metallic appendage wasn't on the ground but it was leading up to a large silver disc in the sky, hovering 20 feet overhead. Cunningham stumbled back, frozen in horror, and watched as Lovett was pulled into the sky and into the disc, which rose into the sky and disappeared from view. Major Cunningham radioed for help, but the horror was just beginning. The site was soon swarming with security teams as they combed the missile testing grounds for any sign of Lovett, but nothing could be found. Cunningham was incoherent and kept talking about an inhuman object having kidnapped the soldier and most believed he suffered a mental breakdown. He was taken to the base hospital for observation and questioning, but he never wavered from his story that Lovett had been taken into the air by a UFO. Backing up his account according to some sources, the base had a radar system that did pick up an unidentified radar contact near the location at the time Lovett was taken. This caused the military to step up the search, examining the surrounding desert for the next few days. But it would be three days before anything was found, and what they found would shock and confuse everyone. It was Sergeant Jonathan Lovett's body, almost 10 miles from where he'd been taken. Many people had suspected Cunningham might have been the one to hurt Lovett, but the location of the body made that near impossible. He wouldn't have had the time to move the body before he radioed for help. The medical examiners concluded that the body had been exposed to the elements for between one and two days, meaning Lovett had been somewhere else before his body was left in the desert. And he was totally naked. But that wasn't the only thing that was different about his body, and horrors that had been done to him made people think of one thing, aliens. Since the earliest UFO sightings, farmers had claimed their cattle were being taken from fields by UFOs and returned to Earth dead and horribly mutilated, often with precise markings that looked like they'd been done by a machine. Most people believed that there were other explanations like cults or natural causes like predators and parasites. A ranting farmer claiming that his prized cow Bessie was taken by aliens wasn't usually enough to get federal investigators involved, and there had been no reports of anything like this happening to a human until now. The on-base medical investigators soon discovered that Lovett's corpse had been horribly mutilated, with his tongue removed at the root and his eyes neatly gouged out. Even more horrifying, his anus and genitalia had been removed, and many of his organs had been taken out. Making it more confusing, they'd all been neatly extracted as if through a surgical procedure. But no mad surgeon would do this to a human. The final revelation about Lovett's body had been the most disturbing. His body had been carefully drained of blood. But the vascular system was intact, not like what happens when someone bleeds to death. Who or what could have done this to Sergeant Jonathan Lovett? The answers aren't going to be easy in coming. Project Grudge Report had 14 files and the first 12 and the 14th have all been declassified. They discuss various UFO sightings with a good amount of evidence for them but no conclusive proof. But Grudge Report number 13 isn't mentioned in any official files and remains firmly classified to this day, over 60 years later. That's left many conspiracy and alien abduction buffs with nothing to do but discuss their theories of the Lovett Cunningham incidents, with each theory having strong proponents but many holes. The most common theory among skeptics is that Major Cunningham killed Lovett, possibly in a dispute over the handling of the debris. But that raises the question, who could have done that to the body so precisely? Cunningham didn't have any medical training, so he would need an accomplice. With the military base having a fully stocked base hospital and on-site doctors, the prevailing theory is that he could have gotten a doctor on the site to find the body, move it further off-site, and do the mutilations to it while the search had been called off to make it look like something otherworldly was the culprit. But this would take a lot of coordination at a time when everyone was being closely watched, and the surgical precision needed was likely beyond the ability of a 1950s Air Force medic. Another theory is that Sergeant Lovett fell prey to the very normal horrors of the desert, and Major Cunningham's exhaustion and confusion led him to see something much more twisted and horrible than what really happened. The New Mexico desert is a dangerous place full of predators, including mountain lions that are large and aggressive enough to drag off and maul a human. It doesn't explain the smooth mutilations, but the long lag time between Lovett's abduction and his body's discovery could mean that he had time to bleed out, and then his body could have been moved again by another predator. But for the descriptions of the body to be accurate, it would take a much more intelligent predator to pull this off, possibly even a human predator. 
One of the most popular theories about unexplained abductions and mutilation involves dangerous cults of devil worshippers who perform sacrifices to their dark god. Usually they target animals in their rituals explaining the rash of cattle mutilations. They'd be able to use the sharp knives and surgical tools needed to mutilate an animal or a person and drain them of blood. While there hasn't been a documented case of a murder traced to these cults, there are many unexplained disappearances throughout the US that have never been solved. The kidnapping of a US soldier, though, would be a massive escalation that would bring a much larger police presence down on these cults, and there's no record of a manhunt for the culprits in Lovett's murder, raising the odds that whatever killed him didn't come from this earth. Are there actually aliens stalking the deserts looking for prey to experiment on and then returning them to earth, their bodies destroyed? The sheer number of cattle found mutilated over the year lends credence to the theory, and the description by Major Cunningham of what took his fellow soldier doesn't match anything from this earth. The extent of the injuries to Sergeant Lovett's body make it hard to imagine anything human or animal could have done it. But if aliens kidnapped and murdered a US soldier, wouldn't the United States have gone to war? We've all seen the movies where aliens attack and America comes roaring back to blow up their ships. The only question is, with what weapons? In the 1950s, the space program was just getting started. The description Cunningham gave of the ship that took Lovett was several centuries beyond anything humans had, and no one would have known how to track it or fight it. If Sergeant Lovett was killed by an alien ship, the US could have done very little but watch the skies and try to prevent another attack. But there's another theory about the strange death of Sergeant Jonathan Lovett that's gaining more attention as people look into the strange case of Project Grudge File No. 13. When a government file is highly classified like File No. 13, good luck getting a look at it. So where do we know about the Lovett Cunningham incident from? A pair of prominent conspiracy theorists have claimed to be part of the long defunct Project Grudge, which allowed them to see the original file. The first, the notorious UFO theorist William Cooper, claimed to have seen it in the 70s and was the first to make public the supposed horrific deaths of Lovett's mutilation. William English, a former Green Beret captain, was working as a US security detail at a base in England when he supposedly got a hold of the file. Colin Bertram, who collected much of the information for a History Channel special of the case, also mentioned that the case was discussed by Frank Joseph, a controversial racist conspiracy theorist who believed a war with extraterrestrials was coming. These three accounts have been circulating, furthering the spread of the rumors about the incident. But what has the government actually said about it? The conspiracy theorists will tell you that the government doesn't want you to know the truth, that they scrubbed all record of the incident from the books, and they would be right. If you comb the military files for any record of the strange death of Sergeant Jonathan Lovett, you'll find nothing. Nor will you find any record of what happened to Major Cunningham after his horrible discovery. But they've gone further, because you won't find any record of either man ever being part of the United States Air Force, or in fact having existed at all. Did the government scrub all record of these men from existence, including everyone who knew them, to cover up this horrible incident? Or did they just never exist at all? What we know about Project Grudge File No. 13 is that a man supposedly died horribly, but there's no record of any of it happening. And the only claims that it did happen come from a trio of discredited conspiracy theorists who claim they somehow got a look at the most highly classified government document of all time. And the government, which supposedly covered up the case for decades, let them go around telling everyone and even publish books on the incident. Was the Black Ops assassin who covered up the incident on leave or something? The truth may be out there. But the truth about the Lovett Cunningham incident may be much closer to Earth, and there's no proof it ever happened. But anyone who reads about it is probably still going to keep a closer eye on the stars. Disclaimer: All of the stories featured in this episode of The Infographic Show come from actual military service members or other government officials, many of them vetted by independent researchers and local or national media outlets. It was late on a chilly February morning, 2007. At approximately 0230 hours, a security patrol stationed inside the nuclear weapon storage area of Nellis Air Force Base, otherwise known as Area 2, called into Central Security Control, a sighting of what appeared to be vehicle headlights far outside the outer perimeter a mile or two in the distance. This wasn't uncommon as Area 2 was detached from Nellis Air Force Base, and everything from hikers to off-road enthusiasts would inadvertently stumble upon the little-known facility in the desert. Following standard procedure, the two outer security patrols, Oscars 1 and 2, were dispatched to assume overwatch positions on the reported headlights. Their job, as it often was in these dark desert nights, was to simply observe and, if the civilian vehicle approached too close to the facility perimeter, intercept it and have them turn around. 
As the two outer security patrols arrived atop the tall bluffs overlooking the reported sighting area, they spotted and confirmed what appeared to be two vehicle headlights approaching down the side of a nearby mountain. Inside of the nuclear weapons storage area, two additional patrols had moved close to the section of the fence the vehicle headlights were approaching, along with the site security supervisor, Security 1. A grand total of 11 Air Force security personnel were watching when suddenly the lights disappeared. Fearing that the oncoming off-road vehicle had turned off its headlights so as not to be tracked, Oscar 1 left its position on the bluffs and moved to an intercept position along the incoming vehicle's estimated avenue of approach. The site's security controller requested the assistance of a main base K-9 unit which had happened to be in the area, and the two patrols linked up, leaving their vehicles behind moved out to the desert to set up an LPOP, or Listening Post Observation Post. The desert, though, was quiet. Despite the incoming vehicle having been within two miles of the fence line, there was no sound of a revving engine across the still dark desert. Scans with both thermal imagers and night vision goggles revealed nothing. And then suddenly, the radio came to life. Patrols on the interior of the nuclear weapons depot began calling in lights on either side of the dismounted Oscar 1 and K-9 patrol. From their vantage point atop the tall igloo-style weapon bunkers, they could see a series of lights appear in the 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 3 o'clock of the dismounted patrolmen. Incredibly though, the three men and one dog on the ground could see nor hear anything. Then the site security supervisor came on the radio. Oscar 1, be advised, the lights are moving on you. The three mysterious lights, seen only by interior patrols, suddenly rushed the dismounted patrolman. The senior patrol leader ordered his partner and the K-9 patrolman to lock and load. With lights approaching their position on the desert floor at high speed, he was taking no chances. As far as he was concerned, the mysterious and now aggressive behavior of the lights indicated hostile intent. What happened next depends on which side of the fence line you happen to have been on. For the three patrolmen and one dog on the outside of the fence line, nothing happened. The three men held their breath, M4s at the ready, and nervously scanned the desert with thermals and night vision but spotted nothing. They even checked with the dog, who was trained to indicate if it sensed danger and yet nothing. After a few minutes, the patrol leader called back in over the radio to ask for an update on the lights but received nothing but static. Trying a second and then third radio, the exterior patrols got no reply and slowly walked back to their vehicles to attempt to make contact with the interior patrols again. On the inside of the fence, though, at least two dozen security forces patrolmen, including the master sergeant security supervisor, had seen the lights converge on the location of the dismounted patrol and then simply disappear. Even more incredibly though, when the exterior patrolmen finally made contact with the interior patrols, they were told they'd been out of contact for 20 minutes. Yet each man involved in the incident on the outside of the fence line swore that only three or four minutes had passed for them. Where had the other 15 minutes of time, all spent without radio contact, gone? Things would only get weirder, though, before they got any better. This incident would prove to be only the opening act to some of the strangest events ever reported by US military personnel. And we can tell you about it in first person because, at the infographic show, we got a chance to sit down with one of the security forces patrolmen involved in these incidents. After the exterior light show incident, things started to get weird. I mean, there had always been weird things out in Area 2. We had everything from ghost stories to weird animal sightings. I'd probably think it was all BS or just tricks that dark plays on you, except a lot of this stuff was seen by numerous people at the same time or with the help of pretty advanced night vision and thermal imaging devices. What started happening after the lights incident, though, took the cherry in weird and outright dangerous. Within a week of the incident, one of the daytime exterior patrols ran across the corpse of a donkey, which wasn't that weird since there was no civilization around us and animals sometimes wandered out there. What was weird, though, was that this donkey had no head. It was cleanly cut off and there was some crusted blood around the neck, but there was no blood anywhere around the body on the ground. We ended up shrugging it off, figuring that somebody had butchered the animal and just dumped it in the desert, completely unaware of how close they got to our facility in doing so. But then, just a few days later, another donkey corpse was found, and this one was missing its head and all four of its legs. Again, no vehicle tracks, no blood on the ground, just a decapitated legless donkey. The very next day after that, a third donkey was discovered by an exterior patrol, this time at night. This donkey was also missing its head and legs, but it had its stomach cut open with one clean incision, and the entire contents of the body cavity were gone. Once more, there was no blood on the desert floor and no vehicle tracks. We forgot about the donkeys after a while, and even though people kept reporting strange lights, nothing too dramatic happened until about six months later. What happened next took the cake. 
and was almost a full-blown national nuclear security incident. We used to practice assaulting our own storage facilities just in case bad guys got in and tried to steal a nuke or just barricaded themselves so they could set off a nuke in place and irradiate large swaths of Nevada. One of those nights we underwent our usual exercise scenario, involving a response by multiple patrols and an assault into our designated training structure. All in all, somewhere around 17 to 18 people were involved. Most of the patrols were at the assault training structure, but we kept the patrol armed with an M249 machine gun on Overwatch just to keep an eye on the desert behind us. Now, Area 2, the nuclear weapon storage depot, was huge, several square miles, so there was lots of empty desert inside the fence perimeter. As we were lining up to assault the training structure, we suddenly got a call over the radio from our Overwatch patrol located on a hill about a quarter mile from us. The patrol said, hey, you got two figures lying prone in the desert behind you. We assumed this was part of the training exercise, so our on-scene commander redeployed a small element to secure our rear as the rest of the response force prepared to assault. However, our flight leader, or security supervisor, immediately came running up to us and told us to lock and load. He then called over the radio and told central security control to terminate the exercise. Then he turned to look at us and said, I didn't put anyone out in the desert, whoever's out there is not us. Now our security supervisor was in charge of running the exercises and he would task random people with playing the bad guys, so when he told us that he hadn't put anyone out there, our blood ran cold. This was about as high a security area as you can get in the US military, home to dozens of nuclear weapons. Anyone who had somehow penetrated our security was not here to have a friendly chat. We immediately returned our magazines to our weapons and charged them, switching safeties off. Our Overwatch patrol had good eyes on the figures. One of the guys on that patrol was using a sensitive thermal camera, and the other was using night vision. That's the standard procedure for us since it gives you two vision modes to ID a target. According to them, the figures seemed to be laying on their bellies, watching us from about 100 meters behind, hiding behind a small berm. The desert out there was pitch black, so we got into a long line and formed a sweeping element. Two heavy gunners on Humvees watched our backs and got ready to light up anything that turned hostile as we started our sweep in the desert. As we approached, our Overwatch patrol warned us that the figures were crawling into new positions. They were actually reacting to our movements and trying to remain hidden. According to the two guys who could see them over night vision and the thermal unit, the figures appeared frantic as if panicking at having been discovered observing us, yet they never stood up and stayed low on the ground on their bellies. For us, on the sweeping element, we couldn't see a thing, despite also using our own night vision goggles. However, the desert was thick with brush, so staying unseen would have been pretty easy for anyone laying low. We kept on moving forward, weapons at the ready, as our Overwatch patrol stayed in constant contact with us, letting us know what the figures were doing. Then, as we got within 25 meters, they just vanished. According to the Overwatch patrol, the two figures were there one moment and then completely disappeared the next. No flash of light, no sound, nothing, just disappeared. We rushed forward to the last known location and swept the area, finding nothing. Although one of our guys had brought his handheld thermal imager and was actually able to pick up traces of warmth on the desert floor. Somebody or something had in fact been laying on that floor, long enough to heat it up, watching us as we practiced our assault techniques. That incident might have been bone chilling to hear about, definitely to have lived through, but it was far from the only incident involving possible UFOs or even aliens and nuclear weapons. Throughout the Cold War, the United States and even the Soviet Union had several extremely high profile incidents involving nuclear weapons and UFOs, and these incidents have been reported by individuals with extremely high levels of credibility. In 1977, unidentified flying objects not only proved that they could intrude on US airspace unimpeded, but that they might even have have full control over our nuclear weapons. As told by United States Air Force Technical Sergeant Thomas E. Johnson, who was a flight security supervisor at the time, one night a security alert team was dispatched in response to strange lights low in the sky. At the time, Johnson was stationed at a North Dakota missile field, home to dozens of Minutemen intercontinental ballistic missiles housed in underground silos, ready to fire on the Soviet Union at a moment's notice. As the team neared the reported area, they spotted lights in the sky ahead of them, varying in color. The lights would zoom from one location to another at impossible speeds, or other times would simply blink out in one location and blink in at another location. The security team leader said that he couldn't tell if they were multiple objects or just one incredibly fast object. Prior to the incident, the security personnel had been briefed by Air Force Office of Special Investigation Agents that unknown helicopters had been reported at other Strategic Air Command bases. The Office of Special Investigation, or OSI, is like the Air Force's FBI, 
and the special briefings indicated that something very peculiar was going on at other US Air Force bases. Yet that night, the object, or objects, didn't move like helicopters and made no sound. What they did do, though, was far more terrifying. Directly under the lights, the missile launch officers responsible for launching the Minutemen in case of war reported that they lost control over some of the 10 missiles they were in charge of. One of the launch officers later said that they couldn't communicate with the missiles, and if they had needed the launch, they would have been unable to. Incredibly, though, this type of incident would be repeated numerous times throughout the Cold War, and sometimes the actual targeting codes programmed into each missile would be altered or completely erased. Each of these occurrences always happened in conjunction with sightings of UFOs. Are UFOs monitoring our nuclear weapon sites? Is it a coincidence that every major nuclear weapon or production facility in the United States has a long history of UFO sightings? For a growing number of people, the UFO interest in our nuclear weapons is very real, and the case was only strengthened when after the fall of the Soviet Union, former Soviet military and government officials revealed that their nuclear sites had also been host to UFO incidents. It's afternoon on the 14th of November, 2004. The USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group is undergoing a series of intensive drills and training in preparation for deployment to the Persian Gulf. Along with the Nimitz, the strike group includes Destroyer Squadron 9, made up of four Arleigh Burke-class destroyers, two guided missile cruisers, and at least one nuclear attack submarine constantly prowling the waters beneath the warships. Altogether with the Nimitz's air wing, this single carrier strike group represents one of the greatest concentrations of firepower on Earth and soon it'll come face to face with something possibly not of this planet. Two weeks before the fateful day, the Ticonderoga-class guided missile cruiser USS Princeton was receiving odd tracks on its ANSPY-1B radar. Initially, a radar operator spotted a formation of 8 to 10 objects flying in formation southward along the American Pacific coast at about 28,000 feet. The objects moved extremely slowly at about 120 miles per hour, which was rather shocking as most aircraft must move faster than that to avoid stalling out. Immediately, the Princeton requested confirmation from accompanying vessels on the unidentified objects. As the backbone of fleet anti-missile and anti-air defense, Ticonderoga missile cruisers operate the most sophisticated radar on the planet and the Princeton's radar contact with the unknown objects was confirmed by several other vessels. An E-2C Hawkeye electronics warfare plane from the USS Nimitz also confirmed a weak radar return on the unknown formation of objects. The objects disappear from radar after continuing their slow flight, moving out of range of the battle group's sensors. Despite the odd radar contacts, no interceptors are dispatched in pursuit of the objects, and they're largely forgotten until suddenly dozens of unknown contacts begin appearing on the Princeton's radar screens. Over the course of a week, senior radar operator Kevin Day records over 100 radar contacts, with some of them well over 80,000 feet above the battle group, well out of the altitude of commercial and most military jets. These objects would often plummet out of the sky at incredible speed and eventually completely disappear out of sight. As the objects don't appear to be threatening the battle group, however, no action is taken against them until that fateful November 14th. Two FA-18 Super Hornets are currently in a combat exercise, prepping for the deployment to the Persian Gulf. In 2004, the Super Hornet is the world's most feared fighter aircraft, a true marvel of engineering that strikes fear in the hearts of any pilot pit against it. Blisteringly fast and extremely agile, the Super Hornet is the Navy's tool for dominating the air battle over any ocean on Earth. Today, though, the Hornets will meet their match with a craft possibly not from the Earth. The Princeton once more detects an unknown track on their highly sensitive radar. After being plagued with contacts for the last two weeks, the strike group's commander authorizes an intercept, and the two Hornets are contacted and told to prepare for a real-world mission. The pilots immediately break off from their exercise and change course, headed directly for the unknown object still being actively tracked. As the fighters close in on the object, the Princeton radios over and asks if the aircraft are carrying live ordnance. Unfortunately, no, the pilots respond. They are only carrying dummy training missiles and no rounds in their cannons. Unarmed, the two fighters close in on the unknown contact, on a mission to at least identify and hopefully chase off this mysterious intruder. The pilots close the distance to the object, and as they approach, they notice a large shape below the waters and disturbing the ocean's surface, as if a huge object about the size of a Boeing 747 was right below the waves. Flying about 50 feet above the underwater object was a smaller tic-tac-shaped object that appeared to have no wings, no exhaust, and no windows of any kind. The object seemed to ignore the incoming aircraft until the lead Hornet started a slow circular descent toward it. The object immediately mirrored the Hornet's descent, but in opposite 
starting a slow circular ascent in a reverse looping motion. This is when the lead hornet decided that it would attempt an aggressive interception and immediately pitch toward the object. In response, the apparent UFO immediately accelerated, flying out of sight in seconds. The Princeton contacted the Hornets and reported that they tracked the object reappearing 60 miles from them. Based on distance covered, this means that the object would have had to move at about 42,000 miles per hour to cover such a great distance so quickly. Any earthbound aircraft would have obliterated itself due to intense atmospheric heating, not to mention the incredible acceleration resulting in thousands of Gs would have turned human pilots into pancakes. Two new Hornets were vectored in on the object's location, but by the time they arrived it had already disappeared. Disappointed, all four Hornets returned to the Nimitz, but as they came in for landing the carrier launched another patrol of Hornets, this time armed and equipped with infrared tracking and targeting pods. These powerful sensors could detect aircraft from tens of miles away via their infrared signature, and in the clear blue skies of that fateful afternoon, if there was anything in that sky, human or alien, they would find it. The pilots wouldn't have to wait long. After once more making radar contact with the UFO, the Princeton directed the Hornets to the object, and within minutes, they were within visual range. Utilizing the powerful FLIR pod, the weapons officer on the lead Hornet was able to identify and track the tic-tac-shaped UFO in both visual and infrared mode. This meant that the object couldn't possibly be a sensor malfunction, as the object not only showed in two different vision modes, but the infrared mode clearly detected the infrared signature of atmospheric heating working on the skin of the object. What was most perplexing, perhaps, was the fact that the object displayed no obvious propulsion system or lifting element of any kind, such as wings. How it flew was a complete mystery. In TV mode, the object was extremely dark against the bright daytime sky, which likely meant that the UFO was colored black or another dark color. This would preclude the object being any known drone operational at the time, as the US Air Force and Navy both operate drones which are painted light blue or white, with their job being to loiter above hostile areas for a long time at an altitude low enough that they could potentially be spotted by an observer on the ground. Drones need to be lightly colored in order to avoid being seen. Whatever the object was, nobody appeared to believe it belonged to the US military. Yet before the Hornets could move in closer, it suddenly accelerated and disappeared out of view of the sensor. Since that fateful day, multiple explanations have been offered for the UFOs encountered by the Nimitz battle group. Yet the fact that the object was clearly detected on radar and then visually spotted on both TV and infrared modes rules out any potential equipment malfunctions creating artificial objects, unless some unknown deficiency in America's most important weapon systems is able to simultaneously create errors on a guided missile cruiser's radar and the infrared targeting pod of a Super Hornet, in that case the US may have bigger problems on its hand than UFOs. The object spotted by the first flight of Hornets cruising just below the depths could very well have been the nuclear attack submarine that accompanies carrier battle groups, and as these subs operate in extreme secrecy, the Hornets would likely have had no idea as to its whereabouts. As to an explanation for the seeming super burst of speed exhibited by the craft at the end of the video, well, this could too be explained by the pursuing Hornet simply banking to the right and away from the object out of the field of view of the FLIR system. Yet, we can't deny that the visual identification of a UFO, along with radar confirmation, is extremely compelling and in the end we simply can't rule out aliens from Zeti Reticuli coming to Earth to feast on our brains. So, is the Earth really being visited by an advanced alien being? Well, it's not likely, and if they are, then they're officially the most boring and confusing alien invaders ever. It just seems strange to us here at the Infographic Show that aliens would cross vast cosmos of space just to play tag with a bunch of our primitive aircraft. Surely they'd want to, I don't know, talk to our leaders? Yet there remains the fact that the footage has in no way become officially debunked and is extremely compelling. One curious item is a comment made by a CIA official many years ago saying, I love UFOs because every time that a Chinese or Russian pilot is pointing at the sky and saying, UFO, UFO, he's not saying American aircraft, the mystery would only deepen when another video was released in 2015 showing US pilots intercepting and tracking yet another strangely tic-tac-shaped object. This time the contact is brief and the object appears to be flying at extremely low altitude, though its exact nature remains unknown. Are we alone in the universe? It's a question that's kept humanity up at night for centuries. Are the glowing lights in our skies just unexplainable anomalies or a sign of life elsewhere in our galaxy? 
Today we're looking at a jaw-dropping selection of footage recorded by soldiers and civilians in Iraq. The footage you're about to see will shock you, astound you, and perhaps even open your mind to the possibility of intelligent life beyond our stars. We'll show you the videos one by one, saving the most shocking and exciting for last, so stick around if you want your mind blown. Before we begin, we just have one more question. Are you ready to believe? The first video of one of these shocking alien encounters comes from 2009 and claims to be footage captured by the night vision goggles of Iraqi soldiers out on patrol. Because it was filmed in night vision, the footage is not completely clear, washed in bright green. However, some mysterious groups of lights can be clearly seen flying through the air. The first grouping could be a plane, possibly, but it's soon followed by a large bright orb of light that flies through the sky, not following a discernible flight pattern. This light does not look to be of organic origin, and it's far too large to be the result of a plane. What is it? No one can be certain, but we can be sure that it's weird and difficult to explain. Could the only real explanation be extraterrestrial in nature? That's up to you. But now let's take it up a notch to an even crazier piece of footage. The next mind-blowing Iraqi UFO video comes from 2014 and appears to be shot out of some sort of moving vehicle. Though the footage is a little blurry and the camera is shaking, there is a definite flying object that can be seen. At first it looks tiny and indistinct, like a little more than a black dot in the sky. As the vehicle follows it, however, and as the cameraman is able to zoom in on it, its shape becomes much clearer. It's oblong, almost oval-shaped, and it does not look like any kind of normal aircraft. If it is of human construction, could it be some kind of classified military vehicle the public doesn't even know about? It's enough to drive you crazy with curiosity. The most unusual thing about it, however, is how it appears to move. It's not just flying through the sky, but changing in shape as it does so. It appears to fold in half slightly at some points, straighten out at others, and even seem to widen in shape all the while it's being observed. Now this could be some kind of weather balloon, but it certainly does not look like one. The people filming the video also seem suspicious of it, speaking excitedly behind the camera as they follow and film the bizarre flying object. They continue filming it until it fades out of sight, leaving no trace behind. And if you think that's fantastical and you're already crafting a new tinfoil hat, just you wait, the craziest is yet to come. The next video has already been subject to a great amount of debate and has been reported on various news sites as well as reposted to multiple YouTube channels. It claims to show a mysterious force attacking what might be the Taliban or possibly an ISIS base. This information all depends on who you ask, but the images depicted in the video speak for themselves. In the video, we see the side of a tank facing an open sky. Unlike our previous video, this sighting occurs in broad daylight, with little room for the possible alien craft to hide. In the sky, a triangular object can be seen flying over the trees. The low image quality makes it difficult to determine, but it bears a slight resemblance to the traditional image of the flying saucer. As the craft draws closer to the camera, a flashing light flickers from its side, as if blasts are being fired. Soon after, areas of the ground begin exploding into clouds of dust, as if the craft is firing on someone or something. The explosions continue, growing larger and more drastic, with massive smoke clouds billowing up from the earth. Somewhere in the clouds of smoke, the craft disappears until the camera is able to locate it again, flying off into the distance. Though the camera work is shaky, the shape of the craft becomes clearer. It has a rounded top and bottom like a traditional flying saucer, but its middle is shaped like a flat triangle with a pointed front and two wings branching out. It's unclear what the craft was attacking or if it was alien in nature, but the footage is certainly convincing. As we make our way to the most shocking and most convincing video of UFO activity in Iraq, we arrive at our next piece of evidence of UFO encounters in Iraq. On the Iran-Iraq border in April 2012, mysterious lights began to appear in the sky. Of course, many UFO stories involve mysterious lights in the sky, so what makes this one different? The difference here is that unlike previous cases where bright lights appear alongside stars and satellites in the dark night sky, these lights appear to be manifesting in the middle of the day. The lights are round and bright white, resembling the orbs that often appear in supposed ghost photography. But these lights are not just staying put in the image, implying possible errors with the film or flares on the camera lens. These lights move around throughout the landscape, back and forth between the blue sky and clouds with ease. Their shapes never change except when the lights fade completely from view. There appear to be at least four of them in total, possibly more, and they move through the sky slowly and steadily. The orbs of light do not move erratically, the way one might expect if they were simply reflections of some kind or even errors in the footage but instead move on distinct flight paths back and forth. It almost suggests a kind of intelligence. 
It seems very unusual that these lights would appear on the border of two nations, particularly Iran and Iraq, and it's not hard to see their appearance as significant. Are they alien in nature? Perhaps the sign of a cloaked spacecraft? Or perhaps they're some kind of alien communication method? Whatever they may be, this type of strange light is not unheard of in UFO encounters. Just last year, some similar orb-shaped lights appeared off the Outer Banks in North Carolina, USA. Their lights were present for over a minute and a half and convinced many observers that there was something unusual going on, possibly alien in nature. The lights are still subject to debate, but this footage from the border is not the only time that mysterious orbs of light have been linked to UFOs, and it will likely not be the last. Finally, let's get to the thing you've been waiting for, the most shocking piece of UFO evidence to come out of Iraq. This video, released on YouTube in 2008, has over 1.2 million views for a reason. A group of United States Marines on January 2, 2008 spotting something very unusual while on patrol in Iraq. The video footage that they took is completely unlike any other famous UFO footage. The footage is tinted green, likely filmed with night vision technology of some kind. While there are no obvious spacecraft visuals in the footage, there is something else that viewers might find disconcerting, even spooky. Coming down from the clouds, there are clearly visible beams of light. These beams of light are incredibly bright, showing up vividly on camera, and appear to be streaming directly down from something that's hidden in the clouds up in the sky. The Marines can be heard talking in the background of the footage, and they are clearly as thrown off by what they're seeing as any of us watching their video might be. One voice can be heard saying, man, that's weird, as others clamor to get a better look at these unusual beams of light, and another voice says, dude, look at it, as someone else inquires, have you ever seen that? Yet another Marine chimes in and remarks, they're all over the place, and truly, they appear to be all over the place, scattered across the visible horizon. One man questions if the light has to do with the ways the stars are shining, but is quickly dismissed by his peers. There is one clear bright beam of light, the main one as one of the Marines refer to it, emitting the brightest light. None of the men filming the phenomenon are able to determine what it could possibly be. While this video may not seem as visually impressive as some of the other UFO footage coming out of Iraq, it is some of the only footage that has been officially verified and reposted by dozens of different accounts. It is also one of the most likely to be completely authentic and not to have been tampered with in any way. The men filming sound genuinely confused, even shocked by what they're seeing, and the bright lights look unnatural, if strange and clearly inorganic in their surroundings. It's hard to look at these beams, which so clearly are coming from something in the clouds, and not assume that aliens are somehow involved. After all, the image of a beam of light coming down from the sky is incredibly common in stories of UFO sightings and of alien abductions. In Paris, France in 2017, a similar phenomenon occurred, with a cigar-shaped UFO emitting beams of a bright light from time to time projecting from the craft down onto the Earth. There were sightings of the same object or a similar object in China in 2010 and Australia in 2014. Some light beams have been explained away as appearances of aurora verticalis, or the crystal beam phenomenon, a natural phenomenon that occurs when light is reflected by a large number of ice crystals in the atmosphere or clouds. This is possible, but the footage from Iraq does not quite resemble the images that can be found of aurora verticalis, particularly because the beams of light in the footage seem more solid, where the aurora verticalis looks more diffused, and even seem to move or flicker on and off. This activity does not seem to line up with the description of the natural phenomenon of aurora verticalis, though it would be a convenient explanation for skeptics looking to disprove the footage, or government agents trying to cover the whole thing up. This footage is hardly the first time the United States military officers have encountered UFOs. Just this year, the Pentagon declassified several pieces of video taken by Navy pilots that depicted encounters with UFOs. The videos had been online for years but were unconfirmed by any official channels until April of 2020, when the Pentagon finally admitted that at least these specific pieces of footage were legitimate. They did not confirm that the footage was evidence of alien life, but at the very least the existence of these UFOs depicted on film has been confirmed. If that footage was confirmed to be accurate, then who's to say that this footage isn't as well? Whatever the case may be, there is certainly a great deal of potential video evidence to suggest that there are UFOs in Iraq, and there may be more out there waiting to be caught on camera. It's a clear August night. You're stargazing in the middle of the Nevada desert with a bunch of friends. Suddenly an unidentified flying object streaks across the sky. The UFO is silent, but clearly moving faster than the speed of sound. Was that a shooting star, one of your friends asks? No, it was definitely some sort of aircraft, says another. Everyone turns their telescope in the direction of the UFO, but it's gone. 
Then one of your friends says, I know what it was. It was a military aircraft that's using alien technology from Area 51. Everyone laughs, but your friend insists that the military has been using alien secrets for decades. A couple of people snicker, but others sit quietly with shifting eyes. Area 51 is probably the most infamous site connected to alien technology. The high security military base did not appear on any public maps for decades, and even after that, the United States government refused to admit it existed. This obviously created conspiracy theories and intrigue over what was happening at the secret base. The fact that the world's most advanced airplanes, such as the U-2 spy plane, were all developed there only adds fuel to the conspiracy theory fire. We know that something secretive is already going on at Area 51. The government has always been adamant about keeping the civilian population out. It has been suggested that the U-2 was based off of technology recovered from an alien spacecraft. The UFO allegedly crash-landed at the location in the Nevada desert where Area 51 is now. At the time of the crash, the US military needed an aircraft that could fly over 70,000 feet and take pictures of Soviet installations and secrets. No other plane had been able to achieve this altitude and speed until the U-2 came along. Your friend suggests that the only reason the US military ended up with a plane that suited their needs was because they stole the technology from the alien spacecraft that had crashed. Also, the U-2 required a never-before-produced fuel that would not evaporate at high altitudes. Are we just supposed to believe that the Shell Oil Company magically produced the new fuel at the same time as the state-of-the-art aircraft, your friend asks? Aliens must have played a role in the development of the U-2 project, or at least alien secrets were stolen to make it a success. Your friend argues that the leap in technological advancements in the decade following World War II just couldn't have happened without alien intervention. How could US engineers and scientists make such big strides without a little help from our friends upstairs, he asks. The rest of the group seems a little skeptical that the U-2 was based off of stolen alien secrets, although it did come out of Area 51, so is it really that crazy of an idea? Another member of the group speaks up. I don't know about the U-2, but the A-12 Archangel and the SR-71 Blackbird were definitely built using alien technology. You and your friends turn to listen to the new speaker. She lays out why she believes the A-12 and the SR-71 are aircraft that were built using alien technology. The unique body shape of those aircrafts alone could have been stolen from alien spacecraft. These aircrafts had a longer fuselage than any other military plane at that point in time. Their distinctive Cobra-like appearance could only be concocted by the minds of aliens. Not only that. But the first A-12 arrived at Area 51 in a specially designed secret trailer. She explains that the trailer itself is suspicious, but what was inside may be even more incredible. Did the trailers contain alien technology that was incorporated into the aircraft? She continues explaining how if the US really wanted to hide the plane from the Soviets, they could have just designed and built the whole thing at Area 51. Instead, the A-12 was brought in specially designed trailers that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars each. That's a lot of money just to spend on transportation unless you're transporting something that could change the world. She believes, like others, that the trailers were made to hide alien technology, which would be incorporated into the A-12 and SR-71. The SR-71 and its predecessor could reach a sustained speed of Mach 3.2 at 90,000 feet of altitude. This blew any previous US aircraft out of the water. Your friend is convinced that there must have been stolen alien technology used to improve the A-12 so substantially over the U-2. It could fly 2,000 miles per hour faster, for goodness sakes, she yells. You shake your head and look back up at the stars. Could they be right? No way. Aliens haven't visited Earth. At least you don't think they have. Then the person next to you clears their throat. <clears throat> as much as I want to agree with you two, I don't know if there's quite enough evidence for me to be convinced that alien technology was used in the U-2, A-12, and SR-71 aircraft. You're about to agree with him when he suddenly says, but the F-117 Nighthawk was without a doubt made from alien technology. Let me tell you all about it. Up until this point in time, aircraft could all be seen by radar in one form or another. There was no such thing as stealth aircraft. Then the Nighthawk was designed at Area 51. The knowledge and engineering skills used to create such an advanced technology must have been based on something. Your friend suggests that stealth technology was just stolen alien technology. It had never been done on Earth before, so maybe it came from beyond the planet. The sleek angles could have been based off a crashed alien spacecraft. Perhaps this very technology was why alien UFOs were so hard to find and track. All the aliens were using it to stealthily fly around our planet. He continues talking excitedly. Do you mean to tell me that the boomerang shape of UFOs dating back as far as the 1940s was designed by humans for the Nighthawk? Absolutely not. It doesn't add up. The design of the aircraft must have come from the designs of a crashed alien spacecraft. There's no way that the US military just came up with the body design and stealth technology for the F-117 off the top of their heads. He's adamant that the Nighthawk is made from stolen alien tech. 
Your friend finishes his explanation, crosses his arms, and sits back in his chair. I bet that's hard to argue against, he says with a smirk. All of your stargazing friends really seem to be into alien conspiracies, but you're still a skeptic. Isn't it just possible that the US had really good scientists and engineers who came up with all the ideas, you ask? Sure, another stargazer across from you says, as they look through their telescope. But if that were the case, how do you explain the new Chinese helicopter called the Super Great White Shark? You haven't heard of this craft before and wait for the explanation. The stargazer pulls away from the telescope, rubs their eyes, and tells the group about the Super Great White Shark that was designed using alien technology. They pull up a picture on their phone. Sure enough, looks just like a classic flying saucer. The Chinese claim that the helicopter was designed to fight in the digital information battlefield of the future. It has a blended wing design that's the same technology used in the United States B-2 bomber. They explain that this technology must have been stolen from a common source, aliens. The US and the Chinese developing highly sophisticated stealth technology around the same time is unlikely. The stealth tech had to have a connection somewhere. They argue that the US and China have never been too friendly, so collaboration is unlikely. Therefore, they must have a common source of information for new technology. That common source is none other than aliens. The stargazer shoves the picture in your face again. The glow of the smartphone screen blinds you for a moment. Look at the shape, they yell. You have to give credit. The shape of the super great white shark helicopter is very similar to a flying saucer. Could this new Chinese aircraft be based off of the spaceships of extraterrestrials? You're not sure you're convinced, but you do wonder how far back you'd have to go before people started attributing advanced military tech to aliens. Then, as if one of your other friends is reading your mind, they blurt out, it was the Nazis. Everyone looks at them. What? You all ask at once. You all may be right about this alien technology and different aircraft, but stolen alien tech was first used by the Nazis, he says. You sit back and get ready for the biggest surprise of the night. The use of alien technologies by Nazi Germany went something like this, your friend says. In 1936, there were accounts of a saucer-shaped ship crashing in Germany. It was claimed to have dead extraterrestrial beings inside. The SS recovered it within hours and used reverse engineering out of the alien technology to make weapons. Hitler and the Nazis were obsessed with the occult, so they may have found other alien technology around the world as they spread like a disease across the continents. The first stolen alien technology used by the Nazis was in their rockets. Your friend carries on with their alien history lesson. The V-1 buzz bomber and the V-2 rocket were light years ahead of their time. Nothing even close had ever been created in human history. The sheer complexity of the rockets compared to weapons that had previously been invented was mind-boggling. It's clear evidence that alien technology was being used. Some conspiracy theorists believe that alien technology went as far as allowing the Nazis to develop missiles that could reach New York and Mars. The Nazis stole alien technology and used it to try and conquer the world, your friend shouts. But that's not all. The Nazis may have discovered fission with the help of reversed engineered alien technology. Luckily, the aliens that the Nazis had found were already dead, otherwise they might have been able to get even more alien secrets out of them. One Nazi technology that's definitely from aliens was the Hanebu. The aircraft's been shown by skeptics to be made up, but I know it was for real, your friend says. It was an actual flying saucer designed by the Nazis. Can anyone really deny that Hitler and the Nazis would do something as crazy as building their own flying saucer? Not really, you mutter under your breath. You look around your friend group. You're still a skeptic, but their ideas have given you at least something to think about. A lot of revolutionary technology was discovered and built during World War II. The decades that followed also consisted of a boom of innovation in the tech world. Could it be possible that this influx of new technology was because of the acquisition of stolen alien secrets? In the summer of 1952, a series of strange sightings took place in Washington, D.C. From July 19th to July 27th, authorities were inundated with reports of unexplained objects in the sky and extraterrestrial craft. The people observing these unidentified flying objects or UFOs weren't just ordinary citizens. Air traffic controllers and pilots were among the first to detect strange craft and even stranger phenomena, ranging from weird white glows to orange balls of fire repeatedly over those few weeks. These events panicked everyone from local DC citizens all the way up to President Harry Truman, who called the Air Force to demand an explanation for what was occurring. Was Washington DC truly experiencing an alien invasion? Imagine you're a reporter working at the Washington Post in 1952. You're a journalist reporting on breaking news and current events for one of the most prestigious publications in the country. And you're still blissfully unaware of what terms like clickbait and buzzfeed mean and how they will ruin your entire profession. On Saturday, July 19th, just before midnight, you get a tip that air traffic controller Edward Nugent has spotted seven suspicious blips on his radar, located 15 miles south-southwest of the city. 
It can't be a cause of human error as his superior senior air traffic controller Harry Barnes saw and confirmed the objects on the radar scope himself. Nugent started the night by joking about the fleet of flying saucers that seemed to be on the screen. Soon, however, he sees the unidentified objects streaking by near the White House and Capitol building. The situation now seems to be less of a joke and more of a national security threat situation. The controllers desperately try to confirm what the blips could be, but there are no known aircraft in the vicinity of the objects on the radar, and the objects aren't following any known flight paths. Barnes adds an even stranger observation confiding in you. We knew immediately that a very strange situation existed. Their movements were completely radical compared to those of ordinary aircraft. Perhaps it's a machine malfunction, you wonder. After all, there has to be some kind of reasonable explanation. Barnes insists that's impossible. Two controllers double-checked the Nugent's radar and found it to be in perfect working order. Furthermore, Barnes called yet another two controllers in a separate tower of the National Airport who also saw seven unidentified objects moving erratically on their screen. Or, as one of the controllers, Howard Coughlin, succinctly put it, did you see that? What in the hell was that? Coughlin and his co-worker Joe Zacco, yeah, that's his real name, also report seeing an incredibly bright white light zoom away at top speed, not on the radar, with their own eyes. At that moment, Barnes suddenly stops talking, stunned. UFOs are multiplying all over the radar scope, converging over the White House and Capitol. There's a heightened sense of urgency as the UFOs approach high-value targets. Andrews Air Force Base, around 10 miles away from the National Airport, confirms that the strange objects have appeared on their radar as well. You call the base to hear that Airman William Brady also personally witnessed an object like an orange ball of fire with a tail that took off at unbelievable speed. What are these erratic balls of light doing? And how are they moving at more than hypersonic speeds? Are they the objects showing up on the radar? Later in the night, you get confirmation that the balls of light are exactly what the radar is detecting. Capital Airlines pilot S.C. Pierman, waiting on the runway for permission to take off, spots what he believes to be a meteor, but then spots a series of white, tailless, fast-moving lights, six in total, over a 14-minute period. Those can't be meteors. He's in communication with Barnes, who confirms that the objects on radar correspond with the appearance and direction of the lights Pierman is seeing. Some of those observing the lights are convinced that they're stars and meteors. In fact, they're even able to prove it for a few of the lights spotted, though not all. This must be the explanation, you think. Perhaps it was an especially active night for meteor showers. However, that doesn't line up with the behavior and the speed of the light seen in person. Staff Sergeant Charles Davenport at Andrews Air Force Base sighted an orange-red ball that would appear to stand still and make an abrupt change in direction and altitude. You know no meteor in the universe moves like that. Barnes sends you a tip, his last communication of the night. He thinks whatever the lights are, they're aware they're being watched. That's right, he's actually sitting here telling you the lights are sentient. Why does he think this is? Well, earlier that night, two F-94 Starfire jet fighters deployed from Delaware to try to get a closer look at the phenomenon. The pilots flew all over DC searching for the lights, but it's all in vain. The creepy lights that have baffled the city have disappeared. Realizing they're running low on fuel, the pilots head unwillingly back to base, at which point the lights mysteriously reappear. Barnes's conclusion is at once logical and frightening. The UFOs were monitoring radio traffic and behaving accordingly. You note the last sighting of the UFOs, 5.30 am. Still no closer to an explanation as to what might be happening to cause these increasingly strange phenomena, you make a mental note to communicate with the Air Force Base tomorrow and see if they have any ideas. The next day you wake up to see the most exaggerated headlines you can imagine. Saucers swarm over capital, according to the Cedar Rapids Gazette. You write a much more nuanced article explaining the events of last night to the public and exploring possible theories, admittedly none of which sound that convincing even to you. But an alien invasion seems too far-fetched a story to run with at this time. On Monday, July 21st, you get a call from U.S. Air Force Captain Edward J. Ruffelt. He announces himself as the supervisor of the Air Force's Project Blue Book research into UFO sightings. Frustrated by the fact that he only learned of the sightings from your article two days later, he's now seething at the Pentagon's lack of support as he tries to obtain a staff car to drive around Washington, D.C. and investigate the sightings. You ask him if, between his dealings with the Air Force and the Pentagon, if he has any idea what might have happened. Ruppelt says that Air Force radar specialist Captain Roy James thought unusual weather conditions might have occurred. What kind of weather created 
creates orange balls of fire streaking through the sky at lightning speeds, you wonder. The rest of the week passes by mostly uneventfully. You're working late in the office again on Saturday, July 26th because you really need a life, and you suddenly notice another call from the National Airport has come in. Finally, perhaps they've finally figured out some sort of terrestrial explanation. Instead, the night's about to take an even stranger turn. The man on the other end of the line sounds disturbed. At around 8.15 PM, a pilot and a flight attendant on National Airlines flight in the air observed some strange lights above the plane. Within seconds, unidentified objects similar to those a week ago suddenly appeared on the radar screen at National Airport and Andrews Base. At the base, USAF Master Sergeant Charles E. Cummings frustratedly denies any theories by those around him that these might be natural phenomena. Later, to an inquiring press, he would state, these lights did not have the characteristics of shooting stars. There was no trails. They traveled faster than any shooting star I have ever seen. You decide you need to be where the action is this time and you head right over to the National Airport and are granted access to the control rooms with the radar screens. The press spokesman for Project Blue Book, Albert M. Chop, also decides he has to arrive on the scene himself to get a better idea of what's happening. It's now 9.30 PM and everyone is preparing for a night of chaos just like the Saturday before. The UFOs don't disappoint. The visuals on the radar screen are astounding. Unknown objects are showing up in every single sector of the screen. No one knows what to make of the situation. Sometimes the object travels slowly, other times they reverse course, and at times they move at speeds calculated to be up to 7,000 miles per hour. Since it's 1952, you don't know this yet, but that speed record won't be reached by humans until 2010, when NASA's X-43A scramjet hit speeds of Mach 9.6, just under 7,000 miles per hour. There is no man-made object in the world that can fly that fast in a world where I Love Lucy has just wrapped up its first season. In fact, sound itself only moves at 767 miles per hour. The atmosphere in the room is one of extreme confusion. In an attempt to get a better look at the lights, the Air Force decides to scramble two F-94 Starfire jet fighters one more time from Delaware. Captain John McHugo attempts to approach the radar blips but sees absolutely nothing. The other pilot, Lieutenant William Patterson, has better luck. While flying over Washington, Patterson identifies four white glows. He then starts to chase them, but eventually reaches his maximum speed and realizes he doesn't have a shot at catching up to the glowing UFOs. However, it appears he might not need to catch up to them after all, because suddenly Patterson looks around and realizes he is surrounded by the glows. He quickly informs ground control, I see them now and they're all around me, what should I do? You look around the room to see who's going to answer Patterson's command. After a few tense moments of everyone staring at each other, ground control responds with absolutely nothing. Because truly, no one on the ground has any idea what to do. A week after the original bizarre UFO sightings, the objects have come back. How is this possible? And why are they showing up on a Saturday again and again at the nation's capital? Is flying over Washington DC and terrifying locals some kind of bizarre weekend road trip for these aliens? The situation has escalated to the point where it now has alarmed the President of the United States himself, Harry Truman. The entire US has caught UFO fever and people are calling the events of the past couple weeks the big flap because the 50s were a boring time for naming things. In an attempt to understand what's happening in his country, Truman has his Air Force aide called Ruffled, the aforementioned supervisor of Project Blue Book. He listens in on the two men's conversation without interrupting. Ruffled's best theory at the moment? A temperature inversion made radar signals bend and show irregularities on the screen. The inversion occurs when a layer of warm air forms in the lower atmosphere, trapping the cool air beneath. This can cause radar to bounce off this low layer and show objects that are near the ground as appearing high up in the sky instead. However, Ruppelt himself admits he has not yet interviewed any witnesses or investigated the security issue in depth. How can a temperature inversion explain several eyewitness accounts, including those of Air Force personnel, control tower employees, and pilots, which all corroborate each other as well as the blips on the radar? As a responsible journalist, you know you owe it to your readers to put forth another account of this weekend's events, as well as the possible explanation, even though it makes little sense. You decide to give your readers a little hope for a future explanation by including the fact that the CIA would be working alongside the Office of Scientific Intelligence and the Office of Current Intelligence to review the two weekend's events and monitor any future developments. On July 29th, Air Force Major General John Sanford, along with U.S. Air Force Director of Operations Roger Ramey, hold the press conference with representatives from almost every newspaper in the U.S. in attendance. When people with such long official-sounding titles are stepping up to talk, you know the situation is serious. The room is absolutely packed. 
It is the most well-attended press conference held by the Pentagon since World War II. Everyone is looking for answers. The Air Force insists the most likely explanation is a combination of misidentified stars or meteors to explain in-person sightings and temperature inversion explaining the numerous radar blips. Reports did confirm that a temperature inversion phenomenon was present the nights the UFOs were seen on the radar. Stanford reassured the press that since the observed blips did not seem to be solid material objects, they did not pose a threat to national security. Some eyewitness accounts actually seem to reinforce the Air Force's explanation. The entire crew of a B-25 bomber flying over Washington had been told they were surrounded by these strange radar blips, but never saw anything to confirm an actual object. The same thing happened with an Eastern Airlines flight. Others remained unconvinced, including most of the radar and control tower personnel who observed the UFOs. They insisted that the repeated strange phenomena over a period of hours that multiple people witnessed could not simply have been misidentified meteors and temperature inversion. Ruppelt himself standing next to you tells you that he doesn't believe the original temperature inversion theory anymore and trusts his colleagues' eyewitness accounts instead over this government theory. During the conference, you notice that Samford keeps dodging questions regarding specific eyewitness accounts. It looks to you like he doesn't have much of an answer for these questions. Collecting all the data and stories, you publish both the Air Force account and the contradicting eyewitness accounts, completely lost as to which conclusion to draw. You decide to let readers sort through the facts and draw a conclusion themselves. As life goes on, you check in on developments relating to that July in 1952 from time to time. And years later, the Air Force's explanation would be more critically examined. Two knowledgeable men on the topic came out strongly in favor of the official explanation. Harvard astronomer Dr. Donald Menzel believed most of the in-person sightings were the result of a mirage effect, partly thanks to the strange atmospheric conditions those nights. Philip Klass, the senior editor of Aviation Week magazine, also pointed out that radar technology in 1952 was relatively primitive. The radar scope would have had trouble differentiating common objects such as weather balloons, birds, or temperature inversion from UFOs. He also threw some shade at the controllers on duty that night, stating that perhaps we had two dumb controllers at the National Airport on those nights. Burn. However, as to Kloss's less offensive point regarding radar technology, he brings up the logical argument that UFO sightings on radar have rapidly declined after digital filters were introduced in the 70s. Or perhaps the aliens operating those UFOs took one look at 70s fashion and decided there's no need to visit the Earth again. One day, you hear from a surprising person regarding the UFO case. It's Faith McClory, the daughter of Captain Pierman, the National Airlines pilot who saw the white bluish lights with his own eyes. McClory insists, as did her father, that what he saw that night could not have been weather related. She is disgusted by what she sees as a government attempts to deflect real questions about the events of 1952. Her stance is clear. I don't want to use the words cover up, but it was very clear. He saw it. Everything was seen on radar. The truth is, we may never know what occurred those strange summer nights in Washington, D.C. 2023 has been a wild year when it comes to the study of UFOs and UAPs, or Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, the new term the Pentagon prefers for the subject. Much of the current public fascination has centered around a series of public hearings held in Congress with several military witnesses. Among them was whistleblower David Grush, an Air Force intelligence officer for 14 years, rising to the rank of major, who then served for two years at the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency at the GS-15 civilian level, which is the military equivalent of a colonel. Grush's claims, if true, are world-shattering. He claims he's spoken to over 40 witnesses, all involved with classified research projects that involve everything from captured alien spacecraft to recovered alien bodies. He's also asserted that multiple witnesses have died either at the hands of the government, military officials, or from the actions of the aliens themselves. Of course, such amazing assertions would need to be backed up by equally significant hard evidence. Unfortunately, that's where there's a snag. And this whole story begins to take on a deeper significance than just one more whistleblower spilling what he knows, or what he thinks he knows, to an investigative panel. We'll need to look deeper into who David Grush is, what his claims are, and what evidence he has or doesn't have. First, we need to step back and see the big picture, especially how the US government and the Pentagon have been in on the UFO disinformation program for a very long time. 80 Years of Lies There have been claims that the US government and its military branches have been hiding knowledge of UFOs since at least February 1942, when an unidentified object was spotted by the anti-aircraft defense crews protecting Los Angeles. It had only been two months since Pearl Harbor, and the country was jittery. 
expecting an imminent Japanese attack. So when searchlights caught a large, almost stationary object in their beams, a moment immortalized by an iconic photograph that ran the next day on the front page of the LA Times, the anti-aircraft crews opened fire. For more than an hour and a half, they fired over 1,400 shells at the object and yet it remained unscathed, eventually slowly drifting inland and out of sight. To this day, there's been no satisfactory explanation of what the object was. After the war, the Japanese admitted they had never flown any planes over the continental US, except for a pair of lone seaplanes during an attack in September 1942 farther north in Oregon. Japan did launch balloons with incendiary devices intended to start forest fires along the US west coast, but those balloons weren't used until late 1944. There's also the infamous Roswell, New Mexico events of July 1947. Again, we have an incident whose explanation has never really seemed satisfactory. The US government has offered multiple explanations, totaling five different stories as of 2023. These include the original explanation, that a simple weather balloon with balsa wood braces and mylar-type plastic was mistaken for a flying disc. But the likelihood that the highly trained staff of the 509th Bomb Group, at the time the only unit in the world qualified to drop atomic bombs, would have mistaken such a well-known and low-tech object for something wholly unknown is laughable. After that, a 1994 Air Force report admitted that this original story was an outright lie, though they used the more polite term of a cover story. Instead, they claimed the Air Force had a top-secret program called Project Mogul, which involved high-altitude detectors to identify when other countries, especially the Soviet Union, had detonated nuclear weapons. One problem with this story is that Project Mogul didn't have any of those detectors deployed around Roswell at the time, leaving many with more questions than answers. Subsequent explanations have included a 1997 Air Force report that stated lifelike dummies were dropped out of research balloons and had been mistaken for aliens, though those tests occurred way after the Roswell incident in the 1950s, but somehow they were included in later Roswell cover stories. One of the most bizarre theories was offered by the book Body Snatchers in the Desert by author Nick Redfern where Redfern states that the US government had been conducting high-altitude radiation experiments on deformed Asian prisoners of war, overseen by captured Japanese scientists. There are so many holes in that theory that most researchers were easily able to debunk this claim and move on to more serious work. One noteworthy clue that confirms something unusual really did occur and that the US government covered up the event lies in the fact that all of the outgoing messages from Roswell Army Airfield from October 1946 through December 1949 were mysteriously destroyed, along with all of the base's administrative records from March 1945 through December 1949. This baffling admission was made by the General Accounting Office in 1995 in response to a request for those files from then New Mexico Congressman Steve Schiff. No explanation of who destroyed the files or why was ever given. The GAO only mentioned that it had happened probably 40 years prior meaning sometime in the early 1950s. Those vital communications would have shown how the military had conducted its response to the event, and especially what, if anything, had been transported away from the site, as well as who would have been present for any of the wreckage cleanup and possible transport. While the absence of evidence is not proof of anything in itself, this thus far unexplainable cover-up has spawned much speculation that the government has been involved in an active program of disinformation from this date forward. The Air Force's Project Blue Book from the 1950s took this one step further. One of the men involved in its oversight, Major General John Samford, gave an official statement that since 1947 the US Air Force has analyzed as many as 2,000 reports of UFOs. He said that they had been able to explain the great bulk of them to our own satisfaction. However, he did go on to admit that there was a certain percentage of this volume of reports made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. There were theories at the time, in the early years of the Cold War, that some of the observed objects might have been unknown Soviet craft. It was well known that the USSR had captured a number of Nazi scientists at the end of World War II, and there were fears in the US government that alongside Soviet scientists they might have developed some new type of revolutionary aircraft. Even if they weren't actual flying craft of Soviet origin, there were additional fears that the Soviets could somehow manipulate the American public's growing interest in UFOs, sowing doubt and fear among the population about the security of US airspace, or even use a perceived UFO threat to overwhelm the then-limited telephone networks, making it difficult for the military to respond to an actual Soviet attack. 
From the early 1950s on, the US government began to take an active, if somewhat hidden, interest not just in UFOs, but in UFO researchers and the groups they participated in. Surveilling US citizens who had not broken any laws should have been illegal, yet we have records showing that this did happen, sometimes to the actual harm of certain citizens. In a few cases, the government, the CIA, and the Pentagon outright admitted that they had direct involvement in meddling with these civilian UFO investigations. Here are some of the most telling examples. In 1973, documentary filmmakers Robert Emenegger and Alan Sandler were contacted by an official from Norton, California Air Force Base about footage of a supposedly landed UFO and their alien occupants that occurred about three years later in 1971. The two supposedly watched the Air Force footage supposedly recorded at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico which reportedly included Air Force personnel walking out and greeting our alien neighbors right on the runway. Despite early Air Force cooperation on the filmmaker's project, permission to use the footage was withdrawn at the very last moment. The two filmmakers went ahead with their film anyway, which included information on the 1971 event, though they removed direct connection to the Air Force sources from the Holloman event. Following the 1974 release of both their documentary and accompanying book, a parallel story in ufology began to emerge that in 1954, then-President Dwight D. Eisenhower met with aliens on the runway of Edwards Air Force Base in the early morning, and that the event was covered up by claiming the president had to meet with a dentist for an emergency tooth problem. The details of this meeting bear a striking resemblance to the Holloman event. A UFO landed on the runway while two of its accompanying craft flew up and stood by, after which a meeting took place between the UFO's occupants and the base's commanding officer. After this bizarre string of events, a fellow named William Bill Moore wrote about the meeting in a 1989 story with the gaudy headline, Ike Met Space Aliens, referring to then-president Dwight D. Eisenhower by his nickname, Ike. This article whipped up a frenzy about that particular night. Original stories claimed that Ike only was shown bodies from a crashed alien craft, but later retellings include the details of Ike meeting aliens on three different occasions, including once with non-terrestrial ambassadors who offered a treaty and an exchange of technology in return for the US giving up its nuclear weapons. The most interesting element of this story is that Bill Monroe outed himself as a government-paid disinformation agent at a spectacular UFO conference in 1989. He admitted in an extremely controversial speech that he had been working alongside the Air Force Office of Special Investigations, also known as AFOSI, with the disinformation agent Master Sergeant Richard Doty, and that Moore's Faustian bargain with the Air Force included him sharing false information with UFO investigators, including the infamous takedown of Paul Benowitz, more on him later. That admission calls into question Moore's publishing of the Ike story, which may have been an early installment of his lengthy disinformation campaign at the behest of the Air Force. It also throws to doubt all the other research Moore has had a hand in, including his 1979 collaboration with Charles Berlitz, on the Philadelphia Experiment, as well as their co-authorship of one of the earliest books on the Roswell crash, The Roswell Incident. In 1983, Doty, the admitted AFOSI disinformation agent, contacted the up-and-coming investigator Linda Moulton Howe, who had won an Emmy for her documentary on cattle mutilation called A Strange Harvest. Doty showed her several sheets of paper supposedly of presidential briefing documents about four UFO crashes in the US, Roswell, New Mexico, Aztec, New Mexico, Kingman, Arizona, and a site in Mexico close enough to the US border that the US military got to the crash site before the Mexican government. This meeting between Doty and Howe took place at Kirtland Air Force Base, so it had to have been approved at some level by the military. The story Doty and his documents wove was truly unbelievable that ETs had created the perfect human for peace and love and placed him on Earth here 2,000 years ago, suggesting that Jesus was a construct of an alien breeding program. That's in addition to all sorts of other wild claims, including that the lone survivor of the Roswell crash, nicknamed EBE, was being kept at Area 51. Doty has since admitted to having been a disinformation agent all along but claims he was just following orders, though it remains unclear why either the Air Force or the Pentagon was so set on obstructing the efforts of a UFO researcher. One apparent benefit to stringing Howe along for months was that the pending contract she had with HBO to produce a UFO special was eventually withdrawn, thus denying a possible second well-received UFO documentary for Howe's then-rising career. 
The year 1979 marked the beginning of the tragedy of Paul Benowitz, something of an engineering genius and an unfortunate witness to some top-secret Air Force tech near his home adjacent to Kirtland Air Force Base in New Mexico. His story began with filming unusual objects over Kirtland, then designing and building his own series of electronic listening devices that appear to have picked up Air Force Signals Intelligence, or SIGINT, passing between the base and the objects flying overhead, likely satellites or drones using lasers to transmit sped-up compressed messages. What concerned the Air Force was the possibility that Benowitz was in the process of trying to decode those messages and that his efforts might be intercepted by some of America's adversaries. Soon, Benowitz launched Thunder Scientific Corporation, which he ran from his home, with various receiving dishes and antennas on his rooftop. Many of those were aimed at Kirtland Air Force Base across the street. When the Air Force got wind of Benowitz's efforts, they began a disinformation program designed to throw him off track. They did this by sharing fake intelligence, including stories that the U.S. had a deep underground military base called a dumb at nearby Dulce, and that the base had been the scene of a battle between U.S. military personnel controlling the upper levels and aliens in control of the lower levels. These stories, delivered by both Richard Doty and Bill Moore, were designed to boost Benowitz's paranoia and were so successful that they forced his family to commit him to a mental hospital, where he eventually died. Moore claims he began his disinformation work when he learned of Doty's work on the Benowitz campaign, but it's hard to know whether to believe his claims or not. The US government going to such extreme lengths as to cause the death of a civilian researcher in order to protect its secrets is indisputable. The question remains if the government is still willing to go to such extremes in order to pursue its current agenda, whatever it is. In 1982, Bill Moore and Richard Doty became involved in another of the most well-known and controversial UFO subjects that of the MJ-12 or Majestic 12 documents. So much controversy has been stirred up by the heated arguments over the authenticity of those documents that they threatened to split ufology to its very core, which might have been the original intention all along. It was 1982 when Bill Moore connected with film producer Jamie Shandera with the idea of producing a UFO documentary based on Moore's research on the Roswell crash. This early collaboration failed to produce a film but the two continued to work together all the way up to Moore's confession in 1989. In 1984, Shandera received a roll of undeveloped 35mm film from an unknown source in Albuquerque. That film contained photographs of what later became known as the MJ-12 briefing documents, including files allegedly prepared for President Eisenhower in 1952 claiming to represent a top-secret agency that reported only to the president and which controlled everything on UFOs, including alien contact and research on extraterrestrial craft. We would be here all day if we tried to cover all the controversy and doubt about the MJ-12 documents. What we will say is that though the documents themselves appear to be fake, many believe that a group like MJ-12, possibly under a different name, might have existed and probably still exists hiding somewhere in the labyrinthian hall of mirrors that is the U.S. military-industrial complex. If the MJ-12 documents were a further Pentagon disinformation campaign, it's possible that they were released with the purpose of confusing any future research about actual U.S. government investigations into UFOs. Additional theories offered by researchers as to the MJ-12 files' usefulness include ferreting out Soviet-era moles or even that the Soviets themselves were the authors intending to entrap possible reverse technology employees buried deep in the vast array of U.S. military subcontractors. These efforts are in addition to the CIA infiltrating an influential UFO reporting group, the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, known as NICAP, beginning in the mid-60s. Their involvement resulted in the removal of famed UFO investigator Donald Kehoe from his director position, in part due to CIA involvement in the organization. This included Nicholas de Roquefort, employed by the Psychological Warfare Staff of the CIA, Bernard Carvalho, who was involved in various secretly owned CIA businesses, and Vice Admiral Roscoe Hillenketter, the first director of the CIA. It's clear then that the US government's hands aren't clean when it comes to the subject of UFO research interference, and is willing to do whatever it takes to muddy the waters and obscure the truth about these events. Current Whistleblowers That brings us more or less to the present where the U.S. population is clamoring for more information on what our government and the Pentagon really know about crashed UFOs and possible captured alien bodies. Things began to increase in intensity when in 2017, 
Three short videos allegedly showing actual UFOs were leaked to the public. One of these videos was claimed to have been from a Navy F-A-18 aircraft flying from the U.S. carrier Nimitz off the coast of San Diego in 2004. Known as the gimbal video because of the infrared camera mount that took the footage, it's been hotly debated whether this video shows an actual UFO or merely the infrared heat signature of a jet aircraft heading away from the pilot. In any case, it doesn't show the Tic Tac object that the pilot, retired Navy Commander David Fravor, claims he saw bubbling the water beneath it and speeding away faster than a bullet. Two additional videos nicknamed The Flyer for forward-looking infrared and Go Fast videos were also released, though these two have been debated back and forth as to what they really show. The Flyer video from 2014 appears to show the infrared bloom from a departing aircraft, much like the gimbal video, while the 2015 Go Fast video appears to show a large bird flying above the ocean having been captured by a targeting system on board a different Navy aircraft. The two pilots on board this last aircraft were laughing at their ability to get a solid lock on, and the abrupt ending of the video just after they began laughing suggests this was not a serious encounter at all. In fact, just the clearing of these three videos by the Pentagon suggests that these were nothing extraordinary at all, and that they were probably known internally to have prosaic explanations, not anything that could be considered out of this world. Two additional UAP videos released in 2021 were equally as mundane. One known as the Splashdown video showed a cell phone recording off of a command room display on the USS Omaha that showed a distant plane's IR reading dip below the horizon, with six minutes clearly edited out to make it seem like the object sped up. The other, known as the Green Triangle video, was filmed on board the USS Russell and showed normal objects at night like the stars, the planet Jupiter, and a lone fighter jet with clearly identifiable FAA flashing navigation lights. This was debunked due to what's known as the bokeh effect, where a cell phone's iris shuts down so much that the objects being photographed begin to be influenced by the triangular arms of the shutter. David Grush enters the discussion. Along with David Fravor, 2023 witnessed a series of congressional hearings featuring David Grush's testimony. His claims have been sensational, that the U.S. government has possession of both crashed alien craft and bodies, that no less than 40 people have spoken to him about classified military projects that involve alien craft retrieval and back engineering of these craft's technologies, and that one of the craft was transported to the U.S. from Italy at the end of World War II with the help of the Vatican, and that the U.S. officials and even the aliens themselves have been responsible for the deaths of Americans in order to keep these secrets from being released to the public. Grush has been a lightning rod for the two competing factions of UFO believers and deniers. On the one hand, he claims his 40 or so contacts who have told him these stories are all reputable and have important military ranks and government connections. On the other hand, he claims he can't reveal their names, their projects, or their locations because of security concerns. He also admits that he himself has never seen any first-hand evidence of captured UFOs or alien bodies. This means that his, quote, evidence is basically hearsay and would be thrown out in court. Grush made his claims known to reporters Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal, who attempted to have his story published in the New York Times and the Washington Post prior to the 2023 congressional hearings. Originally, Keen claimed that the Times was taking too long to fact-check the story, and she and Blumenthal decided instead to take the story to the online media site TheDebrief.com. It's now become clear that both the New York Times and the Washington Post chose not to publish Keene's interview with Grush, though for months Keene vehemently denied those claims. Keene's most recent explanation as of late September 2023 in a podcast interview with Chris Leto was that both outlets did actually refuse to print her story featuring Grush due to there being, as Keene put it, no proof or hard evidence or documentation being offered. Grush was told by Congress that his classified contacts and other information could be presented to the new Pentagon-run All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, but the head of the AARO, Sean Kirkpatrick, says they have received nothing from Grush yet. Kirkpatrick also slammed Grush's testimony in a statement where he called it insulting to the hard-working men and women of the AARO and claimed Grush was never a representative of his unit. Grush fired back, claiming Kirkpatrick doesn't have Title 50 clearance, so he wouldn't have been cleared to look at such classified details as Grush claims he has. Despite the pushback, Grush has his vocal supporters. Longtime UFO researcher Jeremy Corbell, while being interviewed by George Knapp, claimed unnamed elements of the U.S. government and military are out to get Grush. People like Dave Grush coming forward, he broke the mold. He told people how it was. 
I think it was highly frowned upon by certain elements within the intelligence community. In fact, we know it was because, for an example, the Air Force has gone after David Grush internally. There have been numerous attempts to say he spoke outside of his Dobser, Dobser being the Defense Office of Pre-Publication and Security Review, which reviews and clears what military and ex-military members can discuss openly. And we saw that fail, Knapp continued. But there's another attempt right now by another agency. Let's find out if that fails, and I think it will, because David Grush hasn't spoken outside of his Dobser, and I think he's cleared to talk about it more now. Remember when we said he would be unmuzzled? I think we saw that a bit recently, but we're going to see that more. A polarizing figure. On the other side of the equation, longtime UFO investigator John Greenwald, the man behind the FOIA resource, the Black Vault, has his own problems with Grush's claims. Greenwald says there are unclassified files, like his Dobser review file, that could back up some of his claims if he only made them available to the public. All this could easily be remedied if David Grush just released what so many have referenced now in news and interviews and at a congressional hearing. Why doesn't he? Greenwald states that under the new Whistleblowers Protection Act that Congress passed recently, he should be able to post these. 100% yes. And it has nothing to do with whistleblowing on anything. These are Dobser cleared answers. That is not a fact check on the veracity of his claims, but it shows he's cleared to speak about them. When it was suggested that Grush could go to jail if he discussed what was in the Dobser, Greenwald replied, it's clear, clear. That Dobser document is fully clear. This going to jail excuse is such a silly fallback that way too many are using it in this conversation. Apparently, he already gave these answers in his interviews, so why not show us what he cleared? Greenwald continued, why he has not released it to date remains a mystery. One possible answer is that Grush's connections may not all be that original. In 2022, a Twitter post by UFO researcher Dr. Stephen Greer acknowledged that he and Grush had discussed the possibility of a government cover-up involving UFOs and aliens, and that they shared similar opinions about the UFO UAP subject. Despite Grush's claims, he never spoke with Greer about his Pentagon or government contacts, although it's clear that some of his stories dovetail perfectly with the stories Greer has shared for more than a decade. Another possible reason why Grush hasn't released any evidence to back up his claims could be because they're all pure fiction that's been in the public eye for some time. His claim involving a crash saucer in Italy that the Vatican helped get to the US at the end of World War II has been revealed to be nothing more than a 1996 equivalent of the MJ-12 documents. Brian Dunning on Skeptoid.com has pointed out that this event has been somewhat mockingly nicknamed the fascist UFO files, since the 1933 UFO crash in Italy is barely more than a footnote in a series of falsified documents anonymously turned over in 1996 to the Italian media, who showed no interest. It wasn't until 2003 that a man named William Brophy Jr., who has a history of falsely claiming his deceased father had a hand in almost every UFO event since Roswell, began to add more unbelievable details to the story, and that it turned into the Italian version of Roswell. Brophy has been fact-checked to be nothing more than a charlatan, possibly with severe psychological problems. The majority of the Italian UFO story comes from one man's feverish imagination. If this easily disproved fiction is indicative of Grush's other claims, it's no wonder that no action has been taken by Congress or the ICIG. One area where Grush is undeniably right. During the 2023 congressional hearings, Grush also spoke of a defense industry-wide process called IRAD, the Independent Research and Development System. The Pentagon initially created this process to help military-connected industries manage their massive Pentagon funding. Instead, IRAD has turned into a corporation supporting money stream that's ultimately unprofitable and unhelpful for the government. Only major government contractors can use the program while also getting reimbursed by the DoD the entire way. Dan Grazier, a fellow at the Government Watchdog Group Project on Government Oversight, says the IRAD process has been disjointed for years. IRAD has long been a way for the defense industry to get the government to pay them to develop products that aren't likely needed, he told the Federal News Network. If the contractors can convince someone in the government to sign off on a program, they'll get paid again to develop the product further before selling the product through a Cost Plus program. Even though Grush might have presented some truths to Congress during his 2023 hearings, when it comes right down to it, there are three glaring problems with his overall story. First and foremost, much of what Grush has claimed would either be classified or would be unclassified and therefore unimportant. Grush claims that, at some point, he had the suitable clearance to access this material, but the material he claims is world-shaking is still classified and thus cannot be released to the public. 
Anything that he can reveal has been approved in his Dobster file by the Pentagon Pre-Publication Clearance Department and isn't classified, and is therefore considered either false by the Pentagon, harmless or unimportant. By not sharing this already cleared and uncontroversial material, Grush has lost a lot of credibility in the eyes of the public. The second issue is that even after sharing supposedly classified details and closed-door hearings with Congress, and after filing a separate report with the Intelligence Community Inspector General, the ICIG, the ICIG reported to Congress that they have not conducted any audit, inspection, evaluation, or review of alleged UAP programs. In short, their only involvement was to evaluate Grush's claims of retaliation, which could include as little as someone calling him a fraud, or being too gullible, or going as far as warning him that he could be jeopardizing actual classified programs. The ICIG in effect has said the only part of Grush's report filed that they were looking into and that they deemed credible was the possible retaliation against the whistleblower. They made no supporting statement about his supposed UFO and alien claims. The third issue is the question of why he chose to have a public meeting with Congress in the first place. If members of Congress wanted to know what information Grush had, there would be multiple congressional committees that would have been unable to uncover it through official channels with the proper clearances. Did Grush purposely put himself in the public spotlight for his own gain, or was he truly afraid of retaliation from US intelligence agencies? This all leads to a disappointing but very possible conclusion that the publicity around Grush and his testimony may just be one more massive disinformation ploy orchestrated by the Pentagon. Wouldn't this be an easy way to mess with the UFO community without actually sharing anything classified? They did it before with an unknown figure in Paul Benowitz, someone who was considered disposable by the government. If the government or the Pentagon really wanted to be honest with the American public, wouldn't they release verifiable details from past historical events like Roswell or the 1997 Phoenix Lights event or the 1967 Shag Harbor incident or the 2008 Stephenville UFO or the 2006 O'Hare sighting? When they go beyond hearsay as evidence, it'll be hard for the UFO community at large to come to terms with such disappointment, but it's entirely likely Grush, as trustworthy and honest as he might seem, could just be another unsuspecting tool being used by the government to spread more disinformation. Just like Bill Moore and Richard Doty, having admitted to working with the US government and the Pentagon in the disinformation campaign since the early days of UFO watching, so too might Grush in a few years. The United States and other nations are involved in a secret arms race involving recovered alien technology. And before you laugh this video off as another conspiracy theory tall tale, you should know that this time, the source is one of the most credible to ever step forward. UFOs, or UAPs like the cool kids call them, are real. There's no longer any debate on the phenomenon. Any skepticism to their existence is only an excuse to reconcile one's own worldview with the emotionally uncomfortable conclusion that something is flying around in our skies. What exactly this something is, however, is still up for debate. The US government's official investigation into the phenomenon has reached its highest level yet, with multiple open and closed-door briefings to US Congress. In July 2022, the Defense Department kickstarted a new and very serious investigation into the UAP-slash-UFO phenomenon with the All-Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. The stated goal of this new investigation is to resolve what UAPs are, who is behind them, and if they pose any threat to national security. The last publicly known investigation into the matter, Project Blue Book, was initiated in March 1952 and ran until December 1969. It too was launched in response to a rising number of UFO reports and evolved from Project Sign, set up in 1947. With fears of war and with the communists on the rise, so too were fears of Russian Wunderwaffe. But the rising reports of seemingly extraterrestrial encounters grew to a slowly smoldering panic that the government felt pressure to address. Many people already feared a Soviet nuclear attack, and the government also feared the Soviets could somehow exploit the UFO craze to deliver a sneak first strike against the US. The investigation looked at thousands of UFO reports from civilian and military sources, though it was the military reports that the investigation staff was most interested in. In 1969, the entire effort was summed up in what would come to be known as the infamous Condon Report which concluded that UFOs were not worth further study. The Condon Report highlighted the following key findings. Number 1. No UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force was ever an indication of a threat to our national security. Number 2. 
There was no evidence submitted to or discovered by the Air Force that sightings categorized as unidentified represented technological developments or principles beyond the range of modern scientific knowledge. And number three, there was no evidence indicating that sightings categorized as unidentified were extraterrestrial vehicles. However, the report met with immediate controversy after it was discovered that the scientist in charge of the investigation, physicist Edward Condon, had joked about the UFO phenomenon being all a flap, but he wasn't supposed to reach that conclusion until the end of the formal investigation. This seriously undermined Condon's credibility as an academic, as it was clear he was biased and not acting on scientific principles during the investigation. Further criticism arose in 1967 from a memo leaked where one of the investigators assured colleagues that they could expect the study to conclude that UFO observations had no basis in reality. The formal investigation into UFOs was biased from the start. J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer hired by the Air Force to investigate UFOs starting with Project Sign, had initially been deeply skeptical of the phenomenon, until the evidence changed his mind. He called the report unscientific and avoidant of the inevitable conclusion that there were still a significant number of UFO encounters that could not be explained, over 700 in fact. The official investigation into UFOs was shuttered, but it seems the official government interest in the phenomenon continued. Despite this, a culture of ridicule has pervaded the topic and been extremely useful for silencing witnesses. And only now, with US supremacy challenged by the rising power of China, is that culture being retracted. According to the official UAP investigation, this culture of ridicule has actively hampered efforts to investigate UAPs as pilots and other witnesses are intimidated into remaining quiet. Given that some of these UAPs could represent advanced foreign adversary threats, the US military has done a full 180 on its protocols on reporting UFOs and UAPs, with the Navy and Air Force both issuing new guidelines to their aviators and encouraging them to come forward. The new investigation into UAPs, AARO, is yielding reams of data, though much of it remains classified. However, it is now known that UAPs have been detected by US military forces in the air, on the land, and even under the sea. Fears of an advanced foreign threat or a leapfrog technology that could render the US vulnerable to attack are partly driving this new investigation, but so is a serious and growing concern for the safety of American civil and military aircraft given many near misses reported. So far, the investigation has mirrored Project Blue Book, with the vast majority of cases being identified and explained as man-made or a natural phenomenon. However, there remains a disturbing amount of unresolved incidents. However, there's no indication yet that UAPs are alien in origin, though the AARO has confirmed that some of these unknown objects were physical in nature. We could simply just be dealing with an unknown force of nature we've yet to understand. But one whistleblower has come forward with a bombshell of a story, and he might be the most credible whistleblower to date. David Grush served with the US Air Force before separating and taking a job with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, then transitioning to the National Reconnaissance Office. At the NRO, Grush served as Senior Intelligence Capabilities Interrogation Officer, where he worked as the NRO's Senior Most Technical Advisor for Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Analysis Transmedium Issues, at least according to him. He was also the NRO's representative to the official UAP investigation between 2019 and 2021. After that, he transitioned back to the NGA but continued working on UAPs alongside the official UAP investigation and the NGA's own efforts in the area. Now comes the bombshell. According to Grush, the US military has been actively recovering debris from UFOs for decades, starting in the post-World War II era. Even more incredibly, the US has recovered fully intact vehicles. When asked about pilots, he commented cryptically that when dealing with vehicles designed to carry beings, that sometimes those beings were still inside of them at the time of recovery. But the US isn't alone in the effort, as according to Grush, multiple countries have been involved in attempts to recover crashed alien craft. Apparently the US has been the most successful, however. That's probably a good thing, though we imagine Russia would still manage to bungle the Ukraine invasion even if it was armed with Imperial Star Destroyers, mostly because the conscripts would have stripped it of copper for vodka money. 
The government's been keeping this crash retrieval process a secret from even Congress itself. It accomplishes this by hiding recovery efforts within multiple agencies involved in UAP activities and the use of secret access programs. Basically, the US government avoids congressional accountability by hiding agencies tasked with recovering UAPs within other agencies, sort of like Russian nesting dolls. Given that secret special access programs have incredibly limited oversight already, even at the highest levels of power, it would be easy to hide these efforts from Congress. Efforts to build the B-2 was at one point part of a special access program, and this classification is reserved only for the absolutely most critical of US secrets. Grush claims that the world is involved in a silent arms race to exploit and develop new technologies based off a crashed alien junk. The US enjoys the efforts of allies and defense contractors in its attempt to retrieve these downed craft, and one can hope that if what Grush says is true, NATO is at least in the lead when it comes to fielding alien-inspired doomsday weapons. Grush, however, cannot offer any details on these craft of their occupants because, by his own admission, he's never even seen one himself. Instead, Grush says that he became a whistleblower because of the ongoing litany of wrongdoing by people involved in these crash retrieval efforts. Per Grooch, he was approached by individuals involved in the UAP efforts who disclosed concerns over things such as contracting against federal acquisition regulations, the suppression of information across industrial base and academia, and other unspecified criminalities. With mounting concerns over the illegalities and violations of federal law taking place within the retrieval efforts, Grush says that he directly approached Congress to warn it of what he called a, quote, publicly unknown cold war for recovered and exploited physical material, a competition with near-peer adversaries over the years to identify UAP crash landings and retrieve the material for exploitation or reverse engineering to garner asymmetric national defense advantages. How Congress took this news is unknown, but what is known is that what actually happened next directly led to Grush deciding to become a whistleblower. And for once, we have a real paper trail to verify at least part of Grush's story. After bringing the retrieval efforts to Congress, Grush claims that he was the target of a harassment and retaliation campaign perpetrated by individuals inside the DoD involved with these special access programs. In May 2022, the harassment became significant enough that Grush filed a complaint of reprisal with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community in May 2022. Here's where the story takes a significant twist from just another conspiracy theory to a very real possibility that Grush is telling the truth. Grush's background has been largely confirmed via several paper trails linking him to various agencies he claimed to work for. Grush is mentioned in multiple DoD publications starting in 2011, and multiple sources have confirmed Grush's credentials and story to the journalists who first published his claims, Ralph Blumenthal and Leslie Keen, the authors of the original 2017 New York Times expose that revealed the then-secret UAP investigation. However, the sources confirming Grush's story have remained anonymous in order to protect their identities, yet retired Army Colonel Carl Nell was quick to come forward to vouch for Grush's character and his credibility. Nell would make his own explosive revelation in defense of Grush, stating his assertion concerning the existence of a terrestrial arms race occurring sub rosa over the past 80 years, focused on reverse engineering technologies of unknown origins, is fundamentally correct, as is the indisputable realization that at least some of these technologies of unknown origin derive from non-human intelligence. But even more incredibly, we have confirmation that Grush really did file the complaint to the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community and their conclusion one month later that his complaint was discovered to be, quote, credible and urgent. And unlike other whistleblowers, Grush did not come forward alone. He hired the Compass Rose Legal Group to represent him as he broke the story and is represented by Charles McCullough III, who just so happens to himself be a former Inspector General of the Intelligence Community serving in 2011. Grush is likely to be the single most credible whistleblower on the UFO phenomenon to ever come forward, not just because of his credentials, but the paper trail to back up at least some of his claims. And people are taking note. The House Oversight Committee is even now planning a hearing on UFOs based off Grush's allegations, with the intent of discovering if the Pentagon is indeed keeping secrets from Congress. Per Oversight Committee spokesman Austin Hacker, in addition to recent claims by a whistleblower, reports continue to surface regarding unidentified anomalous phenomena. The House Oversight Committee is following these UAP reports and is in the early stages of planning a hearing. 
Bruce's story is causing serious ripples across the Department of Defense and American culture itself, but it's still in the very early breaking stages, and by the time you see this video, there could be even more explosive revelations. However, it's important to remember that Grush has no physical evidence of any of his claims, and one cannot dispel the possibility that this is all a very elaborate and well-built ruse. U.S. intelligence has long used UFO reports as a cover for top-secret programs such as the F-117 and the B-2 bomber. It's also an incredibly imaginative community. During the Cold War, the CIA faked a series of vampire attacks in the Philippines in order to scare communist guerrillas, and by all accounts, the effort paid off in spades. So, during a time of rising tensions with China, a near-peer competitor, it's not a stretch to imagine a world where the US government purposefully fabricates a very believable story about recovered alien technology. Grush could be telling the truth, but he also could be a misinformation agent involved in one hell of a ruse. To see the value of such a ruse, try to imagine yourself in China's shoes as very credible news of quote, multiple nations recovering UFOs and reverse engineering their technology come to light. Imagine that as China, when you look at your own hangars, there's not a single crashed UFO in sight. Suddenly, the fear of the US wielding hyper-advanced weaponry based off recovered alien technology is very real, and you might end up rethinking your approach to international conflicts with America. However, to play devil's advocate, we also have to ask just how many more very well-placed and very credible individuals have come forward before we start accepting that there may be more truth than fable to stories of the US recovering crashed alien craft. It is the single best documented case of non-human intelligence interacting with humans, and it's been ignored or kept secret by the government for over half a century. But in 1957, the United States Air Force collected definitive proof that it was not alone in the skies over America. What would follow was a culture of secrecy so deadly that modern whistleblowers like David Grush, a decorated US intelligence official, have claimed that the government has killed to keep it a secret. On the night of September 19th to September 20th, 1957, a US Air Force RB-47 was on a training flight prior to deploying to Europe. The RB-47 was a modified version of the medium bomber jet propulsion B-47 and built specifically for fighting a nuclear conflict. In the case of a nuclear war, the jet would be responsible for gathering weather information along bombing routes to facilitate subsequent strikes, as well as monitor radio and radar stations for either targeting or to help friendly air forces avoid detection. It was the foremost electronic warfare aircraft of its time, which is what makes its encounter with a non-human craft the single most credible UFO encounter of all time. The RB-47 in question was flying out of Forbes Air Force Base in Topeka, Kansas on a route that would take it out to the Gulf of Mexico and back again over the South Central US. During its flight, it would perform gunnery and navigation exercises while over the Gulf before swinging back around and engaging in electronic countermeasure exercises on the return back to base. The six-man crew included three electronic warfare officers, manning the most sophisticated ECM gear in the world at the time, and it would be this gear that confirmed their otherworldly encounter. As it would later be remarked, you could simply not ask for a better set of instruments to have been present during the encounter. The flight was supposed to be a routine exercise to prepare the crew before their rebasing to Germany, but as the aircraft crossed the Mississippi coast near Gulfport, the ECM gear detected a strange signal emanating from the plane's 5 o'clock position. To ECM operator Frank B. McClure, the signal appeared almost exactly like a ground-based radar signal, which would be used for area surveillance and directing of aircraft. However, the signal's origin was coming from out in the Gulf. McClure at first assumed that there was a problem with the equipment, and that there was a 180-degree ambiguity causing signals coming from the 11 o'clock position to show as if they were coming from 5 o'clock. This would explain the strange radar pulse, as on the mainland there were numerous air traffic control radars active. He figured that the signal he was picking up was simply a radar operating somewhere in Louisiana, a suspicion strengthened by the fact that the signal he was picking up was at 2800 megacycles, a common frequency used by S-band search radars. However, McClure observed the strange signal suddenly move up scope, swinging over the nose of the aircraft and then move down scope to the opposite side. This would have been impossible for even an inverted signal error or any ground radar to perform. Only a high-flying and very fast aircraft with a powerful search radar could have conducted such a maneuver. Either that or the top-secret equipment McClure was instructed to destroy should the plane be forced to crash land was a pile of junk. However, the signal was so bizarre that McClure did in fact chalk it up to some unknown error, 
There was, after all, simply no possible way that any aircraft could be performing the radical maneuver that the sensitive ECM gear indicated was occurring. Thus, he did not report the incident to the pilots, nor even to his two colleagues operating the other ECM equipment. As the signal faded and the plane continued on, the incident was forgotten. But McClure had no idea that he had just recorded definitive proof that an extremely anomalous technological craft had scanned his own aircraft in a nearly 360-degree orbit. The aircraft continued on toward Jackson, Mississippi. The crew was busy performing a scheduled ECM exercise that consisted of detecting and taking action against Air Force ground radars that were along this leg of the flight. As the aircraft turned west over Jackson, though, pilot Louis D. Chase spotted what he believed were landing lights from another aircraft moving toward his own from the 11 o'clock position. The aircraft appeared to be nearly level with the RB-47 and was closing fast, becoming a very bright white light. Chase grew increasingly concerned as the unidentified craft sped straight toward him until he finally alerted the crew to be ready for extreme evasive maneuvers. Believing that he would collide with this unknown jet aircraft, Chase prepared to perform a sudden dive, but then the bright white light abruptly and instantaneously changed the direction of travel. In the blink of an eye, the light changed its trajectory from nearly head-on to their aircraft to the plane's 2 o'clock, moving so fast that Chase would later recall that it was like nothing he had ever seen or ever would see during his career. Just as suddenly, the light blinked out of existence. Chase and co-pilot James H. McCoy began to discuss the incredible event over the plane's interphone. In the rear of the plane, McClure remembered the strange radar signal that he'd recorded on his instruments and the way that it seemed to almost perform a full orbit around the aircraft as if scanning it with radar. He informed the pilots and the rest of the crew and then got the idea to set his number two monitor to begin scanning at the same frequency as the earlier radar receipt. To his surprise, he got a strong signal coming straight from the aircraft's two o'clock position, exactly where the pilot said the strange bright light had moved to just after it nearly collided with the aircraft. John J. Provenzano, operating another set of ECM equipment, performed a diagnostic on the number two monitor utilizing valid and known ground radar stations and confirmed that the equipment was performing optimally. He then used his number one monitor to double check the signal for himself and confirmed the exact same radar signal being broadcast at the aircraft from its two o'clock. The crew continued to monitor the signal, believing that there was a chance that this was simply a ground-based radar that coincidentally was in the same direction the unknown craft had taken. But as the plane continued along its flight path, the signal did not move down scope as would be expected from a stationary ground source. Whatever was blasting the aircraft with tracking radar, it was keeping perfect pace with them. Now the entire aircraft was alert and focused on this problem. They were being tracked by an unknown craft that was beyond the capabilities of any known American craft. Given the tensions of the Cold War at the time, there was a real concern that they might be dealing with an unknown Soviet craft of incredible capability. Chase decided to vary his flight speed to see if the signal would change. But with every variation in the aircraft's speed, the signal remained in exactly the same spot relative to the plane. For over a hundred miles, the unknown craft perfectly matched every maneuver that Chase made. By now, the RB-47 was approaching radar coverage area of the Carswell Air Force Base Ground Controlled Intercept Unit near Fort Worth, Texas. The crew contacted Carswell GCI and asked if they had any other air traffic close to their plane. Carswell would respond immediately that they were tracking another aircraft approximately 10 miles off their 2 o'clock position. The RB-47 was being tracked by both radar and its IFF transponder, but this unknown craft was only being tracked by radar alone. This was alarming for the crew. While they might have had their suspicions about what they were being chased by, the lack of an IFF transponder confirmed for them a growing fear. This was not a friendly American aircraft. By now, the crew had time to analyze the signal better with their top secret gear. For all appearances, the signal was exactly what one would expect from a normal search and tracking radar, which the crew were extremely familiar with. The signal would not have been out of place at nearly any airport or military installation in the world. However, there was something entirely exotic about this signal. While it appeared like a perfectly normal, known human radar signal, even going so far as to simulate the scan rate, the signal was so powerful that according to McClure, the antenna would have had to been larger than an entire bomber to put out that much power. Something was masquerading as a normal, ordinary human radar, even simulating the scan rate of a mechanical radar, which emits pulse as it rotates, but it couldn't hide its massive power output on par with modern ground or ship-based search and track radar and far out of reach of any human military at the time. 
Suddenly, McClure saw that the signal was moving up scope on his number two monitor, confirmed by the immediate message from Carswell that the craft that they were tracking was moving forward of the RB-47. In the cockpit, the pilots couldn't see anything, and yet both the ECM gear and Carswell ground radar tracked the invisible object as it moved ahead to the nose of the aircraft, still keeping several miles of separation between them. Without warning, a massive red glow appeared directly ahead of the aircraft, with the pilots describing it as bigger than a house. Given the 10-mile separation between the object and the plane, this object had to be emitting quite powerful lights to cause the pilots to describe it in such a way. Now, there was independent confirmation of the object from the plane's ECM gear, Carswell's radar, and the pilots who were watching the strange red light keep pace with their plane directly ahead of them. Chase decided to try to catch up with the object, an increased speed to nearly 500 knots. However, the object maintained a 10-mile separation no matter how fast the RB-47 moved, until finally the strange craft began to veer to the right of the plane toward Dallas. Chase contacted the FAA and requested permission to alter his flight path so that he could follow the object. Confirming there was no other air traffic in the area, he was given permission, and Chase banked toward the object. As he picked up speed, the glow began to grow brighter, and he realized that he was finally catching up with it. Carswell then contacted the FAA to inform them that the unknown craft had come to a complete stop. This finally gave him an opportunity to get a good visual on the object, and Chase continued to fly directly toward it. The RB-47 closed in on the object from above, but as they neared it, the pilot suddenly saw the craft blink out of existence. At the same time, McClure announced that the radar signal had disappeared from his scope, and Carswell confirmed that they too had lost track of the object. Chase put the aircraft into a left turn to get back onto their flight path, and while banking the plane, they kept checking back in the direction they had come from for the object. Halfway through the 20-mile turn, they suddenly saw the red light blink back into existence, right along the path the aircraft had taken but at a much lower elevation. Carswell and McClure both confirmed that the object was back nearly simultaneously. Chase and the rest of the crew wanted answers, and thus he contacted Carswell and asked for permission to do something decidedly outside the purview of the RB-47's design. Chase wanted to dive the aircraft straight down onto the strange object to finally get a good look at it. After a brief deliberation, he was given the green light. Swinging the big plane around, he put it into a steep dive coming down on the object that was now below and ahead of the plane. Once the RB-47 reached around 20,000 feet, though, the object once more blinked out of existence. Carswell and McClure both confirmed its disappearance once more simultaneously. The aircraft was now low on fuel and needed to head back to base. However, as the plane got back into a homeward course, McClure detected the radar signal hitting their aircraft from dead astern. The crew attempted to spot the object using the top blisters along the roof of the aircraft, but the unknown object was now behind and below them at an estimated 15,000 feet. The light would follow them all the way back to Oklahoma before finally disappearing. All in all, the RV-47 would be engaged by the strange craft for over 600 miles. The incredibly high-profile incident would come under review during the infamous Condon Report. Hired by the Air Force to study UFOs, Edward Condon put together a committee of investigators to come to a conclusion on the UFO phenomenon. In an infamous 1968 report, the committee would state that there was no credible evidence of non-human intelligence or advanced technology at work over the skies of the United States, and that most incidents were simply misidentifications. However, Condon's credibility was questioned by both the public and the people who had been intimately involved in Project Blue Book, the source for the material that the Condon committee reviewed. Dr. J. Allen Hynek, originally a skeptic on the UFO phenomenon, would not only come to be a believer himself as a result of his Air Force investigation, but would condemn Condon for an unscientific review of the material presented. Condon's credibility was further tarnished when it was revealed that he stated prior to his investigation that the UFO phenomenon was essentially a nothing burger, but he wasn't supposed to come to that conclusion until after his investigation. The Condon Committee's conclusion of the RB-47 incident would completely ignore significant portions of the events as told by the crew. It would also downplay the tracking of the unknown object via as many as four different instruments, as well as its identification by both intercepting its radar signal and being picked up on radar itself. The Condon investigation would conclude that if an object was truly following the aircraft, then the aircraft's own radar should have picked it up. However, the crew of the plane would explain that the radar currently on board the RB-47 could only track a tanker-sized target at a distance of four miles. This would mean that for the aircraft to pick up the object on its own radar at a distance of 10 miles as confirmed by Carswell, 
then it would have to be over twice as large as an airborne tanker. The RB-47 incident remains to this day the best publicly known evidence of a non-human technology over the skies of America, as confirmed by top-secret electronic monitoring gear of the day. It could very well be the first recording of an alien signal, which seemed to at least attempt to hide its origin by mimicking human radars, but it could not hide its power output, which if human would have required an antenna as big as a football field. After half a year of anticipation and a slew of very high-profile incidents involving military ships and aircraft, the Pentagon has finally released a congressionally mandated report on unidentified flying objects. And what's inside the report has sent shockwaves around the world. Keep watching as we unpack the entire recently released UFO report page by page. Shortly after World War II, UFO sightings began to explode across the world. World War II pilots themselves had reported UFOs as well nicknaming them Foo Fighters. But UFOs went mainstream after several high-profile incidents in the late 1940s and 50s. The first was Kenneth Arnold's UFO sighting, where he spotted multiple flying disks in formation, moving several hundred miles an hour faster than his aircraft was capable of. Then, there was the alleged Roswell crash, which, while has been thoroughly debunked by now, still served to spark the public's imagination. Then came the UFO invasion of Washington, D.C., with multiple bright objects spotted hovering over the nation's capital. The U.S. military was immediately tasked with getting to the bottom of the UFO phenomenon, leading to the creation of several investigative bodies that culminated with Project Blue Book. An official and all-encompassing investigation into the UFO phenomenon, Project Blue Book was canceled in 1969 after analyzing over 12,000 UFO reports. Its final conclusion was stark. No UFO the project investigated ever posed a threat to national security. No UFO investigated ever exhibited technology beyond the scope of what was at the time modern scientific knowledge, and there was no evidence that any sighting that remained unidentified was in fact extraterrestrial in origin. Yet Project Blue Book did generate just over 700 incidents that the investigative body could not explain. Some of those incidents were truly hair-raising and included numerous highly credible witnesses, such as the encounter of a UFO over a CIA-funded uranium mine in Africa, reported by a former World War II fighter pilot who was deemed extremely competent by the CIA agents sent to debrief him, or the numerous reports of hovering UFOs over American nuclear weapons storage depots and missile fields, with positive contact on local radar and multiple on-the-ground eyewitnesses amongst the security and maintenance personnel. Perhaps even more chillingly, shortly after the Cold War ended and the Iron Curtain around Eastern Europe fell, came the discovery that extremely similar incidents had been occurring in Soviet missile fields and nuclear facilities as well. Officially, the government stopped investigating UFOs. Unofficially, small internal investigations took place throughout the years as the UFO phenomenon continued to be reported by both civilians and military personnel, though those investigations were more concerned with discovering advanced Russian or Chinese technology and not aliens. Then, in the early 2010s, Nevada Senator Harry Reid secured funding for an unidentified aerial phenomenon program tasked with investigating UFO reports. This would lead to the leaking of several pieces of very high-profile video as U.S. fighter jets encountered strange flying objects off the east and west coasts. Then came a shocking discovery earlier this year. While it was believed that the UAP program had been terminated, the U.S. military had recently restarted an unacknowledged investigation into phenomenon. Early in 2021, the U.S. Congress mandated that the Pentagon had six months to prepare a report on its findings on the UAP phenomenon, and that it should be as unclassified as possible so it would be readily available to the American people. A separate classified copy of the report does exist, but that's only because this copy of the report deals with the technical details of America's most advanced weapon and sensor systems. So, what does the Pentagon's UFO report say? First, this is only a preliminary report, as the Department of Defense Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force continues to operate and investigate the UAP phenomenon. The report begins with an acknowledgement as such, and states that the Pentagon's future goals is to enhance training of U.S. military personnel so that they can better report encounters with UAPs and thus help American intelligence services assess a potential threat. This likely means that after decades of discouraging soldiers, airmen, sailors, and marines from reporting strange things in the sky, a much more open culture of sharing UAP incidents will be created to facilitate the job of the UAP task force. Interestingly, the report also acknowledges that there will be a concerted effort to develop new technologies for the documenting of UAPs. 
Before moving on, the report states that overwhelmingly sensors which have captured UAP analyzed by the task force were assumed to be operating correctly, though there is an acknowledgement that some UAP incidents could be attributed to malfunctioning sensors. Next, in the executive summary, the report makes very clear declarations that the UAP task force simply lacked enough high-quality reporting to draw a firm conclusion on the nature or intent of UAPs. Due to a culture that discouraged service members from reporting UAPs as well as a lack of high-tech sensor assets, the task force had to limit their investigation to reports between 2004 and 2021, and acknowledges that a new system of reporting UAP needs to be established to better assist investigators in their task of discovering the nature and intent of UAPs. Shockingly, though, the report then makes the following conclusion. Most of the UAP reported probably do represent physical objects given that a majority of UAP were registered across multiple sensors, to include radar, infrared, electro-optical, weapon seekers, and visual observation. What this means is that a significant portion of UAPs investigated by the task force were deemed to be real physical objects, verified by their observation across several different mediums of detection simultaneously. So much for glowing swamp gas. The report moves on to acknowledge what UFO eyewitnesses have been stating for years, that in a small number of incidents investigated, the UAP exhibited very unusual flight characteristics. One recent U.S. Navy encounter, for instance, documented on radar, showed several UAPs plummeting from 50,000 feet to sea level in seconds before shooting back up to even greater heights. According to the UAP task force, UAPs could likely be resolved to one of five categories. Airborne clutter, natural atmospheric phenomenon, U.S. government and U.S. industry developmental programs, foreign adversary systems, and the catch-all, other. The task force is of course mostly interested in the final two categories, foreign adversary systems and other, as both could pose a significant threat to the United States of America. The report goes on to state that UAPs without a doubt pose a safety risk to both military and civilian flight, and a challenge to U.S. national security. If UAPs are alien in origin, then that would be an obvious threat to not just the US but global security. However, the task force is most concerned with the possibility that UAPs are evidence that a potential adversary has developed a breakthrough or disruptive technology which the United States does not understand and cannot counter. Given how the US has used both breakthrough and disruptive technologies in war to devastating effect against its adversaries, the fear of such a technology being employed against the US is understandably great. The report moves past the executive summary and into the details of the six-month investigation. Right off the bat, the UAP task force tackles the greatest challenge that it faced in completing its investigation, namely, that reports were hardly ever formally filed by UAP witnesses. This is due to a variety of reasons, such as the lack of a formal reporting procedure for UAP phenomena, which changed with the Navy adopting said procedures in 2019 and the Air Force in 2020. In the future, the UAP task force is hopeful that improved reporting procedures will lead to better quality reports. However, the task force's greatest difficulty in collecting good data was something that UFO eyewitnesses have known for decades. Eyewitnesses of unidentified aerial phenomenon hardly if ever spoke up about their experience for fear of ridicule or ostracization. The task force's report, though, states that as senior military, government, and scientific leadership begins to engage in the topic publicly, the stigma of reporting strange encounters should lessen, leading to better data collected. Another difficulty the task force encountered was that despite having very sophisticated sensors, sensor systems in the US military are typically designed to fulfill a very specific role, and that often means they're not very useful for identifying UAPs. This is likely why the report began with the acknowledgement that new technologies needed to be developed for the specific purpose of investigating UAPs. The report moves on to state that the reports investigated had too little data to allow for detailed trend or pattern analysis. However, there was a noticeable consistency in the size, shape, and propulsion of UAPs. This is a stunning conclusion, as if UAPs were merely the figments of one's imagination or random natural phenomenon, there would not be a strong consistency in the way UAPs look, how big they are, and how fast they move. The report goes on to state that UAP sightings also tend to be cluttered around US military training and testing grounds. This goes hand in hand with a theory long held that whatever they are, UAPs are very interested in the state of our military technology, or it could be an indicator that these are very much foreign adversary systems being used to spy on US forces. However, the task force acknowledges that this cluttering of UAP sightings around US military training and testing grounds could simply be due to collection bias, as those areas have a high concentration of sophisticated sensors and an expectation and guidance by personnel involved to report any anomaly. Now, the report drops another bombshell. 
Out of the hundreds of incidents investigated thus far, the task force identified 18 incidents where UAPs were witnessed performing aerial maneuvers that would signify advanced technology was in use. These UAPs were recorded hovering in place, moving against the wind, performing extremely abrupt changes in speed or direction, and displaying extremely high velocities without any known means of propulsion. In a small number of these incidents, U.S. aircraft also detected radio frequency energy emanating from the objects. Some of the UAPs observed also displayed some degree of signature management or purposeful manipulation of their own electromagnetic emissions. In modern militaries, signature management is a critical era of war fighting, with friendly forces doing their best to screen their electromagnetic signatures from adversaries while making them identifiable to allies. This would imply that UAPs are employing the same form of electromagnetic security measures that modern earthbound militaries do. The task force states that more rigorous examination of the collected data by experts is necessary to ascertain if this is in fact what UAPs have been recorded doing or not, and ends this section by stating that the UAPTF will continue further analysis to determine if these incidents are proof of breakthrough technologies. From here, the report once more states that more data is required to determine the identity of UAP incidents investigated, with special attention needed on those incidents where UAPs are shown to display flight characteristics which would be indicative of breakthrough technologies or signature management, which would be indicative of intelligent control over an artificial object. In their investigation, the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force was not able to attribute any of these incidents investigated to classified U.S. weapons programs. The report moves on to declare that UAPs pose a definitive threat to flight operations and could be a potential national security risk. In 11 instances, pilots reported near misses with UAPs. Touching on the potential for UAPs posing a national security threat, the report states that the task force has initiated an effort to identify any potential technological breakthroughs by potential adversaries, namely China and Russia. This likely means that significant U.S. intelligence resources are also being redirected to the effort, as now the intelligence community joins the hunt to explain UAPs. Given the proximity of UAP to U.S. military facilities and to aircraft carrying the military's most advanced sensor systems, the report seems to indicate that a high priority should be placed on discovering if a potential adversary has in fact developed and fielded a disruptive or breakthrough technology. Because if they have, it's clear the U.S. military is all but powerless to counter it. Finally, the report ends with a call for more resources and better reporting procedures across the American government and military of UAPs. So, does the US military believe that alien UFOs are cruising the skies above our heads? Simply put, no. But the report does acknowledge that a significant number of credible UFO incidents investigated by the UAP task force display instances of technology that would be beyond the scope of what's currently possible. The UAPTF's greatest concern, however, remains that it's not aliens but a potential adversary, which is flying close to our most sensitive military installations and we're all but helpless to stop it. The US government has harmed or killed people to keep a secret UFO crash recovery program a secret. This is the stunning allegation revealed in the most recent congressional hearing on UFOs, this time with three witnesses, one of which claims to have direct knowledge of said crash retrieval program. Here's our breakdown of what exactly went on at this historic meeting. Just in time for the summer blockbusters of Barbie and Oppenheimer, Congress dropped a blockbuster of its own, the first UFO whistleblower congressional briefing to ever take place in the public eye. And here it's important to note that this is the first public hearing because, as the congressmen and women themselves confirm, there have been prior briefings held in secret. The stars of the show were three whistleblowers, David Fravor, Ryan Graves, and David Grush. The world had heard from Fravor and Graves before, who were both involved in high-profile UFO UAP incidents, but Grush is a relative newcomer who dropped his own bombshell in June of 2023. Brian Graves is a former Navy pilot who between the summer of 2014 and March of 2015 was aboard the aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt. During this time period, as the carrier's F-18 Super Hornets operated in training exercises from off the coast of Virginia to Florida, they encountered UFOs on a nearly daily basis. According to Graves, sightings became so frequent that soon pilots were no longer surprised, until one nearly collided with an F-18, prompting the Navy to write up an incident report. Graves' unit would go on to record one of the objects zooming over the waves with their forward-looking infrared camera. David Fravor had his own UFO encounter all the way back in 2004 while he was serving aboard the USS Nimitz as commander of a Super Hornet squadron. 
While on a training flight with his wing woman, Fravor was notified of the USS Princeton detecting unidentified contacts. The Princeton had just received a new advanced radar, and there was concern that there might be some issues to work out. The objects appeared to be descending from 80,000 feet to sea level in less than a second, prompting the Princeton to request Fravor's flight to check the situation out. Upon arriving at the coordinates, the Super Hornets discovered what would become infamously known as the Tic Tac. Observed by pilots and their weapon system officers, the Tic Tac-like object was the size of a large aircraft, but shaped like the candy, and with no visible flight surfaces. When Fravor dipped his Super Hornet down to take a closer look, the Tic Tac mirrored his movements to maintain separation. When Fravor maneuvered aggressively to cut off the Tic Tac, the object accelerated to hypersonic speeds, appearing 60 miles away on radar less than a minute later. The last of the three witnesses, David Grush, has admitted that he's never seen a UFO himself. However, he has seen other things that disturbed him enough to turn whistleblower. Grush was an intelligence officer with the National Geospatial Agency and liaison to the Pentagon's official UAP investigation. In this capacity, he was exposed to multiple personnel whom Grush claims were either a part of or had knowledge of a secret US government program to recover crashed UFOs. Alarmed at the multiple crimes he said he learned of, as well as a complete lack of congressional oversight, Grush briefed the Senate Intelligence Committee, otherwise known as the Gang of Eight, before eventually going public with his claims. Since then, he's been very cagey about what exactly he talks about in a public setting, but he has volunteered multiple times to brief congressmen and women in the appropriate security setting, and as long as they themselves have the proper security clearances. With witnesses set, what exactly went down at this briefing? Grush was questioned about Representative Tim Burchett about his whistleblowing, with Grush confirming that he'd suffered reprisal from within the intelligence community for bringing this information to light. This tracks with what we can verify from Grush. Grush originally broke his story via News Nation, stating that the New York Times was interested but would take too long to publish his story. Grush has never answered why he felt it was important to get his story out fast, with a lesser-known news network rather than the prestigious New York Times, who broke the original Pentagon UFO investigation as well as the Navy UFO videos back in 2017. It seems though that fear of imminent reprisal might have motivated Grush to get his story out to the public as soon as possible. Grush claimed that when he briefed the US Senate about the UFO recovery program, he was immediately harassed and intimidated by members of the intelligence community, claiming that there had even been a break-in to his home. He filed an official complaint with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, who after a two-week investigation wrote a letter stating that it was their opinion that claims about harassment toward Grush from within the US intelligence community were valid and should be investigated immediately. This is a letter we can verify, as it's part of the public record. So despite refusing to speak on specific details outside of a classified setting, we can verify that someone inside of the US government attempted to harass and intimidate Grush for speaking to Congress about a UFO recovery program. Grush would go on to remain cagey with answers regarding his harassment, as the investigation by the Inspector General is still active. He did state, though, that the harassment he endured was, quote, brutal. Tim Burkett then asked Grush if he had knowledge of people being harmed or killed in order to keep this recovery program a secret. Grush confirmed that it had, in fact, happened, stating that someone close to him had experienced some form of harassment, although he didn't go into detail with this claim either. Once more, he stated that he would brief Congress in the proper setting, but confirmed that he had given specific information to the Gang of Eight in his closed-door hearing. From here, the convention turned to UAPs and their very nature. Are these objects a threat to the United States? All witnesses confirmed that while they didn't have the knowledge that these objects were actively threatening, their very capabilities made them a significant threat to the United States, potentially the planet, should they turn hostile. In the words of David Fravor, their technology far outstrips anything in the inventory of the United States. When Fravor and Graves were asked if they felt they could have defended themselves with their F-18 Super Hornets, both witnesses agreed that they felt like they would have had no chance. It's interesting to note here that Representative Tim Burkett had previously conducted an interview with John Michael Godier on his Event Horizon podcast, where he stated that what he had seen in the classified setting made him feel like these objects could potentially be a threat to the entire world. On the capabilities of these craft, Graves stated that he and his squadron would spot these objects hanging in the sky at zero airspeed, meaning that they were actively resisting the force of up to a category 4 winds to remain perfectly still relative to the surface of the ocean. 
However, in the blink of an eye, the objects had the ability to reach up to Mach 1.2 or more and move in very erratic patterns throughout the sky that would significantly damage a living pilot, if not kill them outright. Both Fravor and Graves were of the opinion that current human material science simply couldn't take the stresses of the maneuvers they observed. Fravor would go on to state that what disturbed him the most about the craft he observed was its flight performance. Nothing in the US inventory could match it, and it was clear that if this object ever had a hostile intent, it could have easily destroyed the Super Hornets and killed their crews with impunity. Here we note that in Grush's whistleblower report, he states that he was aware of incidents where military personnel were harmed or possibly killed by hostile acts of UAPs. As usual, he declined to give details that were classified, but the implication is still clear. The US military may have lost lives to the actions of non-human craft. He did also state before this briefing that as part of the UFO recovery program, he was aware of the fact that some personnel involved in the study of these craft had either been killed or harmed. Kinda makes you wonder if the US government has a supply of Class D personnel. After the briefing, investigative journalist George Knapp submitted a letter to the Congressional Investigation written to him by a Russian colonel. In the letter, the colonel claims that the Russian aerospace forces had also been involved in hostile events with UFOs after some of their aircraft attempted to shoot them down on numerous occasions. On at least two occasions, the UFOs disabled the Russian aircraft somehow, leading to the planes crashing and the death of their pilots. After that, the Russian Ministry of Defense issued a blanket order that pilots were from now on to leave UFOs completely alone, warning that their ability for reprisal could be, quote, catastrophic. As part of the ongoing investigation, multiple senators asked David Grush if he could provide more specific details of where the investigation should look next. Grush confirmed that he could share the names of specific personnel, physical locations, and names of projects to look at, even stating that he could provide a list of both cooperative and hostile witnesses. However, as usual, he could not do so in a public setting. This is a major deal because verifying Grush's story is now only a matter of Congress investigating the locations, personnel, and projects that he claims are involved in the recovery program, or have knowledge of it. But this might be trickier than expected because Grush also warned that he was aware of the fact that a number of these recovered craft and materials had been given by the US government to private aerospace companies in order to avoid congressional oversight and freedom of information requests. This took place as far back as the 1950s, and Grush stated that he knew exactly which companies had some of the materials and he'd be willing to share that information. Confirming the claims of conspiracy theorists for the last seven decades, Grush also confirmed that he was aware of a disinformation campaign undertaken by parts of the government to discredit UFO witnesses and discourage their investigation. He would not speak to the details of this in public, but one need only look at the rich, thriving culture of ridicule surrounding UFOs to see just how effective such a campaign has truly been. We are, after all, living in a world where four trained Navy aviators all witnessed a tic-tac object defying the laws of physics and some random YouTube big brain claims they had simply all misidentified a passenger jet in the distance. And people accepted this answer. Honestly, if we've got combat aviators who can't tell the difference between a craft that violates physics and a 747 on the horizon, then America has Russia levels of problems with the competency of its military. Need more proof of ridicule culture? Here's prominent science educator and general science celebrity Neil deGrasse Tyson ridiculing the Navy's Tic Tac video by claiming UFOs are always out of focus, thus insinuating it's nothing more than a prosaic object that's been misidentified. And of course, we're all silly to think otherwise. Meanwhile, Mr. Tyson apparently doesn't realize that the markings on the video, like the elevation deviation lines, are also fuzzy, meaning the entire video is low resolution and likely provided that way by the US Navy because it always derezzes footage from its combat sensors. Further, he fails to account for the four trained aviators who spotted the object, because it's easier to make fun of footage than it is to slander four highly qualified witnesses. This isn't skepticism, it's denialism. The culture of ridicule has seriously impeded research on the topic, even by the Department of Defense itself, which has admitted that pilots are not reporting UFO sightings for fear of reprisal or ridicule. And this matters a lot, because not every UFO exhibits exotic flight characteristics. Some are just strange and weird, and sometimes these strange and weird craft end up being brand new Russian or Chinese platforms. Thanks to a culture of ridicule, the US has been blindsided by the development of multiple foreign aircraft, many of which have been used as reconnaissance assets very close to US operations. 
The U.S. Navy and Air Force have moved to establish new UAP reporting guidelines to try to cut through this culture of ridicule, which is becoming a very serious threat to national security. When Graves was asked about the Roosevelt's encounters and how many pilots he believes actually reported their sightings, he said that he believed only 5% of all encounters were ever reported, and often those reports went nowhere. The briefing moved on to who knew what and what they knew. Grush was asked if there were government personnel who knew more about the UFO phenomenon and a possible recovery program than their peers did, and Grush confirmed that there were in fact some elected officials who were privy to much more information than others. This directly led to the question of if the US government had made any formal contact with non-human intelligences. Grush refused to answer this in the positive or the negative, stating that he'd only do so inside of a properly classified briefing. However, Grush did confirm his earlier claims that we are in fact dealing with a non-human intelligence. As part of the crash retrieval program, biological remains were discovered that were non-human in origin. This was the assessment of the people Grush spoke to, who were working or had knowledge of the program. Again, Grush reiterated that he had never seen these objects or the occupants for himself, but that he could provide a list of witnesses, both hostile and cooperative, who had. At this point, Rep. Matt Gatz disclosed his own experience attempting to gain cooperation from the military on a UAP matter. At some point earlier this year, his office received a protected disclosure notification, or a whistleblower report, of an incident that had occurred to personnel at Eglin Air Force Base. Gatz would go on to confirm that a U.S. surveillance aircraft out on a training flight had encountered a formation of UAPs flying in a diamond formation. Approaching them to take a closer look, his radar and FLIR equipment both malfunctioned and the pilot was forced to take a photograph of one of the objects manually. However, when Gatz arrived at Eglin Air Force Base, he was not allowed to meet with the flight crew, was denied the radar tape showing the four contacts in flight, and was denied access to the photographs taken by the pilot. Gatz had to use his congressional authority to force military personnel to allow him to speak with part of the crew, and while he was still denied the radar tapes, he was allowed to see one of the photographs taken by the pilot prompting Gatz to state that what he was looking at was, quote, something I am not able to attach to any human capabilities. Later, Gatz was told by military test pilots that there was an unspoken code of conduct in the community. You don't report UAPs, and if you see one, then, quote, the best thing to do is to forget about it. After the hearing, Representative Burkett would confirm that he had talked to pilots who stated they often destroyed evidence of UAPs from their aircraft systems just to avoid even bringing the issue up. After the briefing was concluded, to the shock of nobody, the intelligence community denied the congressional investigation the use of an SCIF, or Sensitive Compartmented Information Facility. An SCIF is where the US military and government speaks about the most sensitive of matters. The most highly classified information can only be discussed in one of these specially constructed facilities. Their size can vary from a phone booth-sized room to the entire floor of a building. Their walls are made of material that prevents any form of electromagnetic eavesdropping, and the walls and door are built with reinforced metal mesh or metal studs to prevent forced break-ins. Soundproofing material and acoustic sealant makes it impossible to hear anything from the outside, and the doors feature deadbolts, combination locks, and access control systems. To prevent acoustic weak points, wiring runs along the wall rather than flush with it, and vents allowing air in can only be of a maximum size and protected by metal bars. All cell phones and other unsecured electronic devices are strictly banned, and they have motion sensors to detect movement when not in use. Indications are the congressional investigation is prepared and willing to enact the Holman Rule if they continue to be denied access to an SCIF to hear Grush's testimony completely unredacted. The Holman Rule is a congressional tool meant to help ensure power over the federal government. It allows Congress to reduce the salary of specific federal employees, fire them outright, and even gut entire federal programs. But the real question is why the intelligence community is denying the use of the SCIF in the first place. If Grush's testimony is just more conspiracy theory nonsense, as many believe, then why is the intelligence community interested in a. harassing him directly, and b. denying Congress the means by which to hear his testimony? Even more worryingly, why is the intelligence community blocking legislation that would mandate that UAP reports by commercial airline pilots be made immediately available to Congress? And where does the intelligence community get the authority to block legislation by the people it's supposed to be working for? There's something strange in the skies over the Earth. 
operating from the Southeast Pacific to the Middle East, and even here in the American homeland, the United States military has encountered unexplained aerial phenomenon that even its best fighters and air defense systems have failed to identify or bring down. Now the United States Congress, in a historically unprecedented move, is demanding answers from the Department of Defense. What exactly is in our skies? UFOs and military involvement is nothing new, with the American military swept right into controversy when an unidentified object crashed into a rancher's land in Roswell, New Mexico back in 1947. The crashed item would without question turn out to be a specialized weather balloon, but perhaps fearing the leaking of information on a very sensitive and top-secret program to monitor Soviet nuclear tests, Public Information Officer Walter Hout made the blunder of the century when he dictated a press release that the Army had discovered a crashed flying disc. This massive blunder would go on to entangle the U.S. military with UFOs for decades to come and ardent believers to this day still hold on to the belief that there really was an alien disc at Roswell. Despite the rancher who had discovered the item reporting that he'd discovered wreckage made of, quote, rubber strips, tinfoil, paper, and sticks. He'd only start thinking about UFOs when he heard one of the many popular flying disc stories at the time. Other details, including bodies and material with magical properties, would all end up being reported secondhand. Nonetheless, while Roswell may have been a top-secret weather balloon, Americans were definitely seeing strange things in the sky. In 1952, a series of highly publicized UFO incidents over Washington, D.C. led to growing national paranoia, fueled by the highly misleading facts propagated by national newspaper chains. With fear over UFOs reaching a fever pitch, the U.S. government consolidated several investigations into one single program codenamed Project Blue Book. This investigation would run until December 17, 1969, when the program was canceled after not discovering any credible threat to the United States of America. While Project Blue Book found that people were terrible eyewitnesses and that nearly all sightings could be explained by misidentification or natural phenomenon, the final report did admit that a small percentage of sightings were both impossible to explain and had credible witnesses. Despite this and the growing sightings of UFOs in sensitive military sites, such as nuclear weapons storage depots and ICBM fields, the official investigation was over. Then in 2020, because seriously, when else would this have happened? The doors on the UFO phenomenon were blown open once more by the shocking admission of the United States military that its fighter aircraft had indeed tracked unidentified aerial phenomena. In a massive blow to the conspiracy theorists who claim the U.S. government actively hides evidence of UFOs, the Department of Defense declassified three different videos of UFOs being investigated by American fighters. This was followed by the announcement that the Navy was installing formal guidelines for its pilots to report encounters with UFOs. All the press attention also revealed the existence of a then-classified program run by the Department of Defense between 2007 and 2012 meant to study unidentified aerial phenomenon. The head of this classified program would himself go on to say the following about his findings. These aircraft, we'll call them aircraft, are displaying characteristics that are not currently within the U.S. inventory, nor in any foreign inventory that we are aware of. Once more adding fuel to the UFO fire was the revelation that in 2019, U.S. Senators received a classified briefing on UFOs by Navy leadership, with the spokesman for the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations stating, Navy officials did indeed meet with interested congressional members and staffers to provide a classified brief on efforts to understand and identify these threats to the safety and security of our aviators, painting the UFO phenomenon as a concern to the safety of pilots. The statement may have inadvertently admitted that something was in fact being encountered by American military and civilian pilots even if it necessarily isn't of alien origin. Given that the U.S. recently confirmed it had already flown a prototype sixth-generation fighter aircraft, we can only imagine that part of the reason so many of these UFO investigations have remained classified is because of the need to maintain secrecy around extremely sensitive weapon systems being tested by the U.S. military, some of which have likely been spotted by civilians who no doubt thought they were looking at alien aircraft similar to the way that the flight tests of the B-2 bomber and F-117 during the 80s led to an avalanche of UFO reports. Yet it seems that the American Congress is not satisfied with the answers it's received so far, and now it's official. The American military has 180 days from the start of 2021 to give a detailed and complete disclosure on the UFO phenomenon. For conspiracy theorists everywhere, it's time to rejoice, as the congressional mandate dictates that the report must be unclassified and thus available to the public. 
The report instructs various intelligence agencies and the military to analyze in detail UFO data and intelligence gathered by the Office of Naval Intelligence and now defunct Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force and the FBI. UFO reports are actually nothing new, with curious congressmen and women occasionally tucking in provisions for mandatory briefs on the phenomenon into funding bills. Yet this report is different as it's the most comprehensive gathering of interagency data on UFOs since Project Blue Book. It also formally establishes an interagency process to both gather and analyze future unidentified aerial phenomenon and report on these findings to the federal government. The report also mandates that any potential threats to national security posed by UFOs should be identified and calls on the American intelligence community to assess whether any potential foreign adversary, such as China or Russia, are behind the UFO phenomenon. Before you get your hopes too high though, while the report's mandated to be unclassified and thus accessible to the public, Congress approved the inclusion of a classified annex. This doesn't necessarily mean that any specific information on UFOs is being kept secret, but rather is a necessary measure for such a comprehensive report to be possible in the first place. Such a detailed report on UFOs is going to include highly classified details, such as intelligence sources in foreign governments and the testing and capabilities of next-generation weapon systems which may have led to UFO sightings themselves. It will no doubt also include highly classified details of America's most sophisticated tracking systems, all information the US would not want its adversaries to get their hands on. This report certainly comes at an auspicious time, with in late 2020 the former head of the Israeli space program publicly announcing that the US and Israeli governments were in cooperation with extraterrestrials. The statement coming from such a highly placed government official and credible witness was sadly largely lost on a public completely focused on COVID-19 and an explosive presidential election. For believers in our visitation by aliens from outer space though, these two almost back-to-back -back developments signal at a greater plan to slowly indoctrinate the public to the reality that UFOs are real and aliens have been visiting us for decades. We just have to be prepared for the formal announcement by the slow disclosure of evidence to their existence. If that's true, then there's going to come a pretty big blow to the poor nerds who've been wasting their time poring over boring computer data over at Breakthrough Listen, the multi-million dollar privately funded program that's focused on eavesdropping on the electronic signals of alien life out in the universe. Now that we're pretty sure aliens are here, learn how to protect the Earth with how to defend the Earth from alien invasion. Or check out this other video.